This meeting is now called to order. <coughs> Roll call, please. <coughs> Mrs. Cloninger. Here. Mrs. Cons. Here. Mr. Lavalley. Here. Mr. Salt. Here. Mr. Temby. Here. The Pledge of Allegiance will be led by Mr. Temby. Well, I'd like to welcome everybody tonight. This is the first time that we have had a spotlight at the beginning of our board meeting. And Mr. Jamie Lester is here from Eagle View to uh, to start us off. And I just want to just mention briefly that I am the liaison officer, uh, li officer, excuse me, Freudian slip, liaison for the for Eagle. I was a liaison officer in the military. That's why I hear liaison and that word just pops up for Eagle View Middle School this year. So I will just take a minute to introduce them. Last year, Eagle View's Lego robotics team, the Electric Eagles and the Microbots, won both first and second place in a state competition. The teams went on to compete in international competitions in Texas and California last spring. This year, the teams are partnering with feeder elementary programs at Woodman Roberts and Douglas Valley to build upon last year's successes. Each April, Eagle View celebrates the month of the military child. This past year, the Lieutenant Governor Daniel, uh, excuse me, Diane Primavera joined Eagle View military students and parents for an open discussion about their experiences living with military lifestyles. Please welcome Principal Jamie Lester and the sixth grade math teacher and instructional coach for arts and integration, uh, Jamie Seligovic. Thank you, you have the floor. Yep, um, uh, so uh, really excited to share with you tonight a little bit about arts integration at Eagle View. Um, this has been 16 years in the making. So 16 years ago, um, we started a school within a school model. Um, I was a first year teacher in the very first year of that program and was a part of that program in its inception. Um, during the course of those 16 years, what we found is that through strong PLCs, partnerships and collaboration going on amongst our teammates, um, a school within a school model is not what we were. We had realized that those practices were expanding throughout the entire building. And so uh, for the last several years, we've been working on the transition to school-wide arts integration at Eagle View. And so uh, what we're gonna be sharing with you this evening is one approach to arts integration that we use. Um, uh, arts integration is a, an approach to teaching. Uh, it's not something we do every single day by any stretch of the imagination. It's something that needs to be natural and needs to complement both the core content standard that you're looking at and the art standards as well. Okay, and so I've, I've projected there the uh, definition from the Kennedy Center about that um, symbiotic relationship between those two standards that need to happen for arts integration to be meaningful. Um, and uh, we have an incredible team this evening that's gonna be sharing some examples and then hopefully drawing some of you up to uh, engage in an arts integration approach, okay? Um, so first and foremost is uh, Ms. Jema Salgovic. Um, uh, Jema uh, has taught at Eagle View now for in her 16th year. Um, and uh, has become our instructional lead for arts integration for the entire building. She's supporting all of our teachers in the building with those different approaches. Um, we encourage teachers not to force arts integration. It doesn't work well when it's forced. It really does need to be a natural fit. Um, and that's why I tell you, we don't do it every day. Um, there are some schools that have tried that and it just doesn't seem to, to work in the same way. Uh, and so uh, doing it intentionally um, uh, with approaches like what you'll be experiencing this evening, I think is, is a really powerful tool. Uh, I also want to introduce some of our students for you here. Uh, we have Cece, if you can stand up, wonderful. Um, Mateo, Nicole, and Luke have joined us this evening. And we really appreciate that. All right. Um, uh, the scope that we look through as we look at our arts integration and we encourage you, and I know this is the, the, the realm you all live in, uh, is our board ends. And so uh, when you focus on knowledge and skills that students are gonna be developing um, uh, moving forward, uh, that is a very powerful thing, but watch these students as they're collaborating with each other in this process um, and reflect on it as you're doing it yourselves. If you're brave enough to come up and join us with the, with the second round after watching it once, um, uh, but look at these uh, character traits and I think you'll see that there, these are opportunities throughout this process for our students to reflect and, and, and to grow and to be coached by uh, amazing teachers like Mrs. Salagovic here. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and hand over the, the, the mic to Mrs. Salagovic um, and really look forward to, to having the opportunity to share this with you. So today we're gonna try a strategy called Tableau. What this is gonna be is it's a collaborative living picture that the students are gonna make with their bodies. And we use Tableau for a lot of things. 
We use it to pre-assess to see what they already know, to activate prior knowledge. We want them maybe to deepen comprehension of a skill we have just taught. Often we'll use it as a formative assessment just to make sure that by looking with what choices they're making, if they truly understand the concept. Um, sometimes it can be a summative assessment if we take a little more time with it. It's really good for vocabulary or sometimes it's just a refocuser and a transition from one activity to the next in the classroom. So with Tableau, there are four steps. Students are required to think. This is their individual spot. And once they have their idea, you'll see them cross their arms like this. Then they'll go around and share. There's no commenting about the sharing. They'll just share an idea that they have of what they thought about. Then that's where the really cool stuff happens. So when they'll do it up here, really listen to their conversations because they're going to start planning. What should we make? What parts do I need? What parts will I play? And then they're going to create it. And the drama standard that we do with it is we look at staging and spacing. So we talk about high space, medium space, or low space. So you should see them use all levels of space. So the standard that we went with, since these are my eighth graders, is a standard that they did at the middle of last year, just so um, you can see what they were doing. So the mathematical standard is really trying to identify when um, a graph shows a proportional relationship. So for those of us that it's been a while, it'll go through the origin, it'll make a straight line, and the unit rate is at one comma, whatever the number is. And then the standard that we match it with is really the theater artists in the drama will find different ways to communicate meaning. And so they're going to organize their thoughts and their ideas and go from there. So if I can have my eighth graders come up front and center. I don't know how to make it. So. OK, so when we do Tableau, we'll project a sentence stem where it's the start of their thought. And so I'll say, OK, guys, I want to know what you know. You know a graph is exp expressing a proportional relationship when. You have one minute for this challenge. Go. <laughs> All right, you have about ten seconds. <laughs> okay, and then at this point, when they're done, we have one person per group read the sentence stem. So Frozen in your pictures. High space, medium space, low space. Go ahead. Thank you guys. <laughs> All right, so this would be an example of a formative assessment. And then so within that minute and as they get more comfortable, it goes faster. I'll be able to see and there's lots of ways that we can share. So sometimes one group will share another. Sometimes each group will share one thing. Is this um, there is another type of Tableau that's called a um, 
a text card tableau and that when the teacher wants to control what the students respond to a little bit more. So this is an example of deepening comprehension. So at this point, if anyone is willing to play with us and try, please stand up and come join my eighth graders. Go ahead. Emma. Yeah, if you're willing to, I would love that. Is anyone else willing to play today? There are <laughs> All right. So we can do one Tableau team instead of two. OK, um, this time you can see that the words are color coded. I've controlled the sentence as the teacher. Um, so each person is going to assign themselves a color. Since there's four colors and six of you, two of you will say one color twice. So decide which one that will be. What will your voices do when there's more than one person speaking? OK, um, so you're going to think, share, plan, create. And then when you are reading the sentence stem, one person will read yellow, one person will read purple, one person will read green, one person will read blue, and then you all will say the circles part. You have one minute to tableau how we solve equations. On your mark, get set, go. That 10 seconds start creating. Took one, yeah. Another one. <laughs> All right, I do want you to say it once you are ready. I'm looking for frozen bodies. I'm looking for high, medium, and low space. Let's you're thinking about that. <laughs> All right, whenever you're ready. Isolate the variable. 
Awesome. So at this point, I could have them talk and practice a lot. The more they say the sentence, the more it'll drill into their brains, which is really, really good. Um, I could also give them feedback about their high, medium, and low space. And then it's just a way to deepen their comprehension. Because if you notice, if they say it over and over, and then they're creating the connections with their bodies about what it means and what the process means mathematically, too, it's going to stick a little better. I just want to highlight the fact that this woman is brilliant. Uh, yep. Because I will tell you, as a, a former social studies teacher, social studies lends itself to arts integration very, very easily. But to do it successfully in a math classroom is absolutely incredible. And so uh, uh, she does amazing work with that. Um, these skills are taught in sixth grade to our sixth graders. And then they progress through the years. And it gets more and more complex as they work through their time at Eagle View. And it builds upon each year. Um, for those wonderful, uh, daring board members who took part, uh, we do have some uh, spectacular uh, Eagle View challenge coins. Um, this is based in the military tradition um, of, of sharing Thank challenge you. coins. Um, and so uh, on the back of it, it has our, our SOAR matrix, uh, safety, ownership, active engagement, and respect. Um, and so just a nod to our military connections that we have at Eagle View as well there. So thank you so much for your time this evening. We really appreciate it. And a huge thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Ms. Matson Bonet, are there any updates to the agenda? There were updates to the agenda, and the board was notified of these. Members of the board, are there any items you wish to move from the consent agenda? Are there any items to be added to the agenda? May we have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger. Aye. Mrs. Cons. Aye. Mr. Lavalley. Aye. Mr. Salt. Aye. Mr. Temby. Aye. Board quote, Mr. Temby. My quote tonight is from uh, Kofi Annan. Knowledge is power. Information is liberating. Education is the premise of progress in every society, in every family. And Kofi Annan may be a familiar name. He was a Ghanaian diplomat, diplomat who served as the seventh Secretary General of the United Nations from 1997 through 2006. He won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2001. Knowledge is power. Information is liberating. We should never be afraid of a comprehensive education, talking to our kids about what not only they are learning but thinking, and then trust smart children to go forward as educated citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Temby. Board comments, Mr. Salt. Thank you. Um, just really wanted to appreciate uh, Eagle View coming out tonight. and. Uh, that was amazing. So uh, thank you to them for coming. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, that's all I have tonight. Just. OK, thank you. Um, Ms. Kahn's. Thank you. I just want to give a brief shout out to a couple of uh, my liaison schools that I got to visit with last week. So Chinook Trail Elementary got to come help at field day and it didn't rain, um, at least my day, I got lucky. I don't know how both days went, but um, I ran the football and javelin throw. And what was really probably the most fun was asking all the kindergartners, what is this called? The javelin, 
no one guessed it, but they learned a new word. Uh, arrow, dart, you know, we had some really creative ideas. But, um, and just, it was fun to meet Mr. Harris, Coach Harris, I guess we call him, right? Over at uh, Chinook Trail Elementary, the PE teacher. And he just could not express enough how much he loves being at your school. And um, it, he's just thrilled with um, the families and the support that the parents come out and give at Chinook and really thrilled for D20's fantastic managing and Mr. Shoemaker's fantastic managing of the budget because he's got a bigger PE budget to uh, support our kiddos than he used to at the other district he used to work at. So it was fun. So I was super glad to be there. And then uh, I got to go to STEM night at Encompass Heights Elementary School. And just a huge shout out to Mrs. Paige Kraus and Principal Jenny Sturk for starting this program from the inception of the school five years ago, I think. And aside from being a uh, top-notch uh, dyslexia center for students with dyslexia over at Encompass Heights, they have this huge, amazing STEM program that um, from what I understand is integrated into all of their, a lot of their classwork too, as well as STEM being a rotation of specials, if I understood that correctly, just like Spanish or art or anything would be. So my whole family wanted to come, my husband and youngest daughter, because they were super thrilled to go do STEM stuff. So we all and had a, fit, had a family uh, date and played with microscopes and programmed robots and um, of course, we know there's a ton of pride in D20 and all of us for our schools that we're affiliated with, but I don't think I've ever heard so much pride as I heard from the parents at Encompass Heights, <laughs> and they wanted me to tell you that they were the best school, so I'm passing that message from them along, okay? And um, there was one mom in particular who had been homeschooling her kiddos um, until this year, and she, uh, someone brought her over to me because they wanted me to make sure I heard that she could not believe the opportunities afforded to her kids, um, just that she hadn't been able to, she had no idea what she wasn't exposing her kids to that RD20 schools have. And so she was just over the moon that she was part of Encompass Heights. So thanks to those schools for welcoming me and I'll be back and seeing all of you guys soon, as soon as I can this semester again. Mr. Temby. Well, thanks again to Eagle View, and I'm glad that uh, my colleagues went out there instead of me. So, um, last Wednesday, uh, Superintendent Haber, uh, Ms. Kahn's, Ms. Kloninger and I went down to Canyon City uh, to attend the CASB Region 6 meeting, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later in the meeting, So, uh, but it was a great meeting and uh, always good to get together with peers out there from other districts. Um, just a couple of slides uh, to show tonight. Um, we talk about parental engagement in schools and a great indicator of student success is having parents involved in schools. And so I went to back-to-back -back, uh, events at a couple of schools. Uh, Frontier uh, had dads and donuts, uh, which was a misnomer because there are a lot of moms there. But I think they had about 300 donuts at uh, Frontier and I think they all got to eat. Uh, so in the lower uh, left uh, there, that's Dr. Julie Murray, and uh, the name escapes me, but that is the new head of the PTA there. And uh, they were effusive about the fact that they had just doubled their PTA this year from last year. So they are really getting excited at Frontier about uh, leadership change. Uh, and uh, it's very people centric over there and they're very excited about that. And the PTA is a reflection of that enthusiasm at that school. And then next slide, uh, I went right over to Donuts with Driver. So Kristen Driver is the principal at Explore Elementary where three of my kids went. Um, and she uh, uh, had a, <coughs> excuse me, I'm fighting allergies. Um, I had a great program and we talk about transparency and people knowing what's going on. And so she had a very engaged audience of parents and she talked about PL, uh, PLCs and MTSS and just kind of the mores and tenants around uh, Explorer Elementary, uh, talked about social emotional health. You'll see a slide on ruler there, but it was a great presentation. And then she took 
every question that came, and there were several, um, but uh, it was handled well, and you could tell the parents appreciated it. So, so that's all I've got today. Thank you. Ms. Cloninger. I did not get my photos uploaded because there were too many things going on this week, but I will tell you a couple of things that I did. Um, as uh, Mr. Temby said, a few of us went down to the CASB meeting um, down in Canyon City. Um, it's always good to meet up. It's kind of our own time to do our our cab, our school board PLCs, you know, so it's time for us to um, collaborate with our people. Um, and then also uh, I did a Down syndrome walk with a large amount of people from the D20 area. We had probably 50 people in the picture that we took and we called it the Pine Creek kiddos, but a lot of them came through Chinook. Um, and uh, then I was representing a kiddo from also Chinook. He's Chinook this year, Tyler. Um, he wasn't able to be there. And so we took a little teddy bear as our little flat Stanley around for him. Um, and, but it was really sweet to see him with, you know, see all of the different kiddos. Um, and it has, as you know, become homecoming season. So um, there's lots of games and lots of dances to be going to. And so I've done both. I um, have been kind of up, my son graduated from Pine Creek last year. So I've been up in the Pine Creek area for their um, homecoming and dance. Um, I just wanted to say a little shout out to that school for how inclusive they are of our um, kiddos in our special needs um, department because both on the cheerleading and in the homecoming um, royalty, they crowned kids with special needs. And it was so touching that one of our teachers, who I don't want to call out because I haven't asked her, her if I could, but she came and thought that her kiddo was being nominated because it was a joke and that people were trying to be mean. And once she realized that he actually got crowned as royalty, as one of the younger junior royalty, she just cried. And, and the kiddos just one by one went up and talked about how incredible he was and how incredible they you know feel about him. And I just thought that's exactly what I love to see in our schools. And that's what I do see. So I, it was just beautiful. Um, and then also, um, because we were at the golf tournament a few weeks ago, um, uh, and Kaiser was one of our, our donors um, for some of the um, golf hole and, and other things, um, Superintendent Haber and I were um, invited to go and be at the Kaiser table for the state of the city. It was Mayor Yemi's 42nd, I mean, he he's the 42nd mayor and it was actually on his 100th day, and he had 42 objectives that he had planned on doing and had gone through all of that. And then also um, our communications and, and college and career pathway. So we had some of our cabinet and some of our college and career pathway in a D20 table as well. It was really neat. And um, this is the one, I, I wanted to say a special thank you to Michelle Wolf with Kaiser, because she's who hosted um, Super, uh, Superintendent Haber and myself. Um, and this is the one that kind of broke my heart that I didn't get the picture up in time, but I went to a fun run today at uh, Antelope Trails and they have a camping theme of, of adventure and education and things and it was very sweet, but I stayed for the kinders who all came out with matching shirts and a stick with a giant marshmallow on it and they were the happy campers <laughs> and they all let the sticks go before they went running around, but they do this huge run and then they do a foam thing at the end and it was a riot and a half and they had a ball and it was just lovely. So um, it was great and I, I love being in our schools and, and this is why we do it. So thank you. My name is Conjure. I think there is a, they do, a, there's a lot of fun runs. I'm going actually two fun runs, I think next week. Um, so there's a lot of fun runs this time of year, which is cool. Um, about, I think it was in February of 2020, um, I was talking with Dan Olson, the principal of, of um, Air Academy, and I said, Dan, are we teaching the Constitution? Are we teaching the Bill of Rights? Are we teaching the Declaration? He said, Tom, yeah, I think we are. He really, he goes, why don't you come in and sit on a, on a government class? I said, I'd love that. And then COVID hit, and it just kind of blew up everything. Fast forward, I have Air Academy this year, and I 
emailed Dan. I said, Dan, I'd love to do that if I could. And he said, great. So I went to uh, an AP government class taught by uh, Rick Thiel. And you may remember, I think it was a year and a half ago, he was the chosen speaker at the capping ceremony for Air Academy. And uh, it, it was real fun. And, and I, what, what they did that day was the students had to come up with a proposed constitutional amendment. And then they had to defend it. And it was it was typically two. And then they voted. And of course, uh, it takes two thirds of the House. That, well, there's two ways to generate amendments that go uh, proposed amendments that, to go to the states. One is a convention of states. The other is two thirds of the House, two thirds of the Senate. So they took a vote and they said, if two thirds of you don't agree, then it fails, which is which is kind of cool. And it was neat. And I and some of the ones that that they proposed were um, um, restrictions on semi some, somewhere on the left, you'd say somewhere on the right, somewhere in the middle. It was just it was just a real mix. Uh, restrictions on semi-automatic rifles, a change to to go to a flat tax, allowing people living in our territories to vote in a presidential election. Um, you must take a cognitive test to run for president if you're over 65 years old. So that was way too young, but that was just me. <laughs> um, but uh, and, and it was great because they were pretty hard. Um, and I remember there was one that was uh, congressional term limits and very few of them actually passed. So the students were like, eh, I don't, I'm not so sure uh, that I like this, but it was really good. It, it got them to think. And it was they obviously knew uh, one of those little pieces is how do you how do you create a constitutional amendment? And I, I was really pleased. In fact, um, Rick said, hey, why don't you come back? Uh, we're going to do a mock Senate, I think, in a couple months. And I said, please, you know, text me if if I'm off, I'd love to go. So I was just very happy, very pleased to see that, yes, I do believe um, we are teaching the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, which are so important. Um, and then I got to sit in uh, remotely on the uh, Apparent Academy Building Resilience. I want to thank Julie Moser, Jennifer Morales, Martha Hinson, Steve uh, Terizakis, and uh, Kristen Segrin. And they talked about the seven C's of resiliency, competence, confidence, connection, character, contribution, coping, control. And um, uh, I, I like these parent, in fact, let me just encourage parents to either attend virtually or be there for the parent academies. They're really good. And what I like about them is it's for parents. And, and it's that emphasis that this district has, needs to have, continue to have on parents, parental involvement. And I, I really appreciate that we spend that time. And they're generally very practical. They're very good. Um, and I, I just thought it was excellent. So I want to thank all those folks uh, for doing that. And then um, September 17th was Constitution Day. I want to wish everybody a, a, a delayed Constitution Day. So uh, that was all I had. Superintendent comments, Superintendent Haber. Right. Well, Bart, this has just been uh, another wonderful couple of weeks. So as um, Ms. Cloninger has mentioned, uh, D20 attends the state of the city. It was a wonderful time together. Uh, uh, not only being able to get to know uh, folks at the table at the Kaiser Permanente table, but as uh, Heather mentioned, we had a whole group of our D20 cabinet there. And I really think uh, what's important to me is that we're really getting out and uh, forming relationships with people uh, and leaders in our city. And this was just a really great opportunity to do that. Um, my school visits have been super fun. Uh, last Monday, uh, School in the Woods. That was just such a treat. Uh, down there in the right-hand corner, the students were all getting their different jobs that they had to go out and do. Uh, and up in the left-hand uh, corner, uh, the principal there was giving a lesson around bees, and that was fascinating. Uh, the hive is missing a queen bee right now, I found out, and they were all kind of uh, out of sorts. The bees were because they don't have a queen in there. The queen was coming that afternoon, however, so they were preparing uh, the students of, uh, you know, the, what would probably, what may happen and was asking what's going to happen when the queen gets there. How are the rest of the bees going to react? Uh, but really, <laughs> it was great. And uh, just the energy, and I love the authentic learning that's happening there. I had a chance to go to Discovery Canyon 
And uh, over in the left-hand corner, I couldn't help but put, this is uh, Executive Director over IB, Jan Lauder. And it was really fun for me because Jan and I worked very closely together for 10 years in Aurora Public Schools. She sent me an email. She goes, oh my gosh, you know, you're back. And we had this great reunion. Uh, but really, I will tell you the English department there at Discovery Canyon were just phenomenal. The, the conversation that they were having around their use of IB and they are participating in a program where they're getting some um, uh, free type of um, professional development from IB with the English department. Uh, but one of the English teachers, when we asked him what was the strength of IB, he said um, that it was really empowering students to own their own learning. Uh, because they're, they've, uh, with IB, you have a lot of different rubrics that students can look at, so they're able to say, well, here's where I think I'm at, and here's where we want to be. And we know that that is a huge uh, support for uh, student learning. And then, of course, the, the rocketry that was going on there, uh, I was invited to one that's coming up in Pueblo. I'll try to make that one, but he says, if anything, they have one in the spring where they have the big rockets. So I want to for sure uh, go to that. And I didn't have uh, pictures, and I have a, a link, and I'll have that up for you next time. But I had a wonderful visit today at Air Academy High School and uh, had a chance to meet with their um, English department chair. And she was just, um, just very enthusiastic and really glowing about the work that their team was doing around professional learning communities. And so I said, well, you know what happens when the superintendent's there? You're going to get invited to a board meeting. So she was excited. They'll come maybe in November and from a high school perspective. And, and I'm so thankful and appreciative that we have Chinook Trail Elementary here to talk about PLCs as well. Because as we learned in our study session, that is just like the rock foundation of promoting academic success and growth. Uh, so we are also celebrating our students. Uh, we have 13 students that were named uh, National Merit Scholar semi-finalists, semi uh, and these set, uh, seniors represent the top 1% of students who receive some of the highest scores on the PSATs. Uh, their next step is submitting an application to become a finalist. So congratulations to the following students, Air Academy High School, Elizabeth Rose and Elijah Sakamoto. Uh, Discovery Canyon, A.D. Hoffel, Jake Sakio, Riley Varn, and Alex Juanita. Uh, Liberty High School, Oliver Lambert, Pine Creek High School, Amari Liu, uh, Heng Shen, and Megan Smith. Rampart High School, Ashe Despande, and Village High School, Abre Schmal, and Derek Pendley. So we're just so proud of our students um, and just their accomplishments. Next slide, Pine Creek High School. Congratulations to Asha Agral, a Pine Creek High School senior whose digital artwork earned uh, an artist spotlight on the 2023 Military Child Education Coalition Art Contest. Uh, Asha's dad served 20 years in the Air Force and transitions to the Space Force two years ago and her artwork titled Journey uh, depicts the globe encircled by a red ribbon marked with insignia of both the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Space Force. Liberty High School dance teacher, uh, congratulations to Leslie Williams. Uh, she's again the dance teacher at Liberty High School. She's named the 2023 Outstanding Dance Educator Award from the National Dance Education Organization. She was recognized for her work in creating and nurturing one of the most unique dance programs among high schools nationwide. Uh, most recently, through Williams' direction, the Liberty Dance Team was invited to perform at the National Dance Education Organization's annual conference uh, during their students' uh, their student sharing showcase. And there they are. Uh, Rampart High School Cram and Yearbook. Congratulations to Rampart High School's Yearbook and Broadcast News Program Yearbook, who received an All Colorado rating for their work in the 2023 school year. Uh, at the annual state competition held by the Colorado Student Media Association, the journalism programs received the highest rating a program can receive in the state and several other first place awards, including first place in the 5A video program and first place in the personality profile writing. Hey, Superintendent Haber, yes. I would be remiss if I did not stop you and say K-RAM. 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 <laughs> Uh, Mr. Mooring would be hearing that, just so you know. It's Perfect. a big deal. 
<laughs> Thank you. Do not want to make those kind of mistakes. I appreciate that. Air Academy um, High School's DECA programs created a new business endeavor, their very own t-shirt printing shop. Uh, this is an addition to the school's two coffee locations operated by the DECA program, which is a CTE pathway for students at the school. This new shop allows students to learn entrepreneurial skills, no matter their abilities, and raise funds to help with travel costs as they compete across the country this year. Superintendent, that is DECA. Oh, stop it. Oh, <laughs> I know better than that. Come on now. See what I have to put up with every time we have a meeting. I'm just saying. Um, so this is our village high school. They had their first volleyball game um, under their belt for the first time village high school history. The school hosted their first athletic match for the new girls volleyball team, and they had a great turnout. And principal Nathan Gorsh said this has been a great culture boost for the entire school community. And then uh, the Air Academy mountain biking team took home first place at their most recent competition in Glenwood Springs. Uh, this team is made up of high school boys and girls who travel throughout Colorado and race on some of the state's toughest outdoor courses. And this team couldn't be as successful as they are without the help of parents and coaches who combine their resources to travel with these students and their equipment. So congratulations to them. And we just want to, um, and there they are, let's see, there we go. Just a few uh, highlights for athletics. Um, Liberty High School athletes are having a great month. Uh, the boys soccer team had three knockout games against Sand Creek, Palmer Ridge, and Lewis Palmer. And the football team earned their first win against Gateway last week. And the volleyball team will, doing some, will be doing some community service this weekend. So congrats to our Lancers. And then uh, Pine Creek, uh, congratulations to Pine Creek High School boys golf and cross country team for winning the 2023 Colorado Springs Metro League Championship. And we're sending kudos to the football team who is currently ranked a number two in the 5A group this week. So go Eagles. So I just want to set the stage very quickly for um, our Chinook Trail Elementary uh, team that's here with us. As we know, these are our board ends and um, the professional learning communities and the work that our teachers are doing are just key to ensuring that all students reach these ends. We are going to start work uh, shortly uh, within the next couple weeks on a portrait of a graduate. And um, you know, what is our vision for students really through their K-12 journey on what are those skills exactly that we want them to have when they cross the stage in graduation. PLCs, as you know, are all about collective efficacy. Uh, that shared belief that because we have a collective action uh, that we're going to have higher uh, outcomes for students, especially with increase in student achievement and academic growth. And as we know, uh, PLCs, uh, it, goes way beyond the scale of 1.2. It's actually a 1.57. It's one of the highest uh, effects that we can have on student achievement. And that is a result of John Hattie's research. And she's and he has done many meta-analysis and is really considered one of the leading educational researchers in the field. Uh, we've looked at this. The triangle was different either way. We know that uh, PLCs and when teachers come together to do that collaborative work and look at data together, set goals and hold each other mutually accountable for the results, uh, whether we're talking about behavior or academics, uh, all students uh, are able to achieve. And professional learning communities are focused on student learning, the collaboration, and again, that focus on results. So with that, um, if the Chinook Trail Elementary team would come up, and Principal Pat Shoemaker, if you would like to uh, start us off. I will do that. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to share tonight. It is always fantastic as the leader of a school to not only share the great things that are going on, but have the amazing folks that work in this building get a chance to share their story as well. So um, we've been on the PLC journey for probably five or six years now. Um, and this year we took a hard look back at what our story is going to be this year um, as we've grounded all of our work. 
and a big component of that is our work around our professional learning communities. Chinook Trail, um, during the tenure that I've been there, this is year 13, has had a long-standing history of great academic performance. But I will tell you this process has caused us to look and look deep at where we are exceeding and we celebrate that. But also it's identified the challenges that we have in our building and quite honestly where we're not being successful with 100% of our kids. So it's allowed us the opportunity to just have a space where we can have those honest conversations. And you're going to hear a little bit more about that tonight. So I'm going to ask my AP to join me now, but I would acknowledge these folks. I have an amazing new assistant principal, Corinne Kessler. Um, and then a wonderful first grade teacher, Cynthia Edgar, and fifth grade teacher, Kira Slaymaker. So, and you'll hear a chance from all of them tonight. Um, but first of all, as the leader, when I look back over where we've been and decided what we wanted to change this year, um, a big reflection on my part as a leader is to say and acknowledge as amazing as I am, I cannot do this work by myself. It was humbling, um, as I quite frankly get pointed out. Um, but it'll, Did your wife write that? <laughs> she could have, um, but in all seriousness, um, I think this is a monumental task. When you set a goal for 100% of your kids and in a school of 630 today, um, that we are going to make a promise to our parents and our community that they're all going to be successful. Um, a principal can lay that vision, um, but if you don't have people behind you who can really do the work and truly believe in it, it's not going to happen. And we've had great performance, but we're not 100%. Um, so one of the pieces I reflected on over the course of last year is how do we get that more sustainable? And it really was identifying a guiding coalition. Um, and so we set aside funds to attend the PLC Institute this year, and I took a team of nine with me, and it's the best thing we could have done, and we'll highlight that in a minute. The other big piece that we did was we reworked, and the Royal We, my new AP, reworked in amazing fashion a brand new master schedule. Um, it has rocked the world of our staff um, because it's change and change is hard. And if I would have tried to do this or Corinne and I would have tried to do this on our own, it would have failed. And we are stumbling through it right now, but we are stumbling forward and that is progress and that is good for our kids. So part of what that work has done is to give whole group um, dedicated time. We extended out our time in both ELA and mathematics this year. We set an expectation that every classroom will have not only quality whole group instruction in a small amount of time, but we will have targeted small groups and we'll have targeted small groups every day and it's built into the schedule. So we've taken away um, that hurdle that teachers have to get over um, if their schedule didn't allow for that. Um, we've built in our intervention time so that children do not miss whole group or small group to go into intervention time. We also believe in the whole child aspect of it. So every classroom every day is starting off with a morning meeting and that is built into the schedule. So again, that welcoming to all of our kids and I see you and I appreciate you and I'm glad you're here is happening across all 24 classrooms. And then in addition to the wonderful two hour opportunities that this board has given us um, on the 12 Fridays a month, we reworked the schedule to build in PLC time on every Friday. We don't have two hours on those off Fridays, but we have an hour built in on those Fridays. So our teams continually to do that. And that was a big piece that came out of the work of our guiding coalition. And so in front of you now, you see a wonderful picture of the spirited team that I have. Um, this picture was taken in June after we got back from the PLC Institute. So this talented group of professionals also committed to coming in over the summer to help our team plan our new story at Chinook Trail. So we expanded it this year. Um, well, the team, we took nine. We had five of our six grade levels represented, represented as well as our dean and AP. And then once we got back, we added in our MTSS coordinator as well as representation from the one grade level team that wasn't able to send a representative with us. This team gives up um, at least a morning every month to meet with just us and we guide and we reflect and we have honest conversations about what's going well and what's not. Um, and then they go back and they are leading their teams. And in this month that we've started this process, we've gotten more momentum than we have in the past four years. Um, and I would like to take credit, but as humbly as I have to admit, it was to the folks behind me um, that are doing that great work. And now Corinne's gonna talk about the changes that, um, sorry. Um, 
it helps if I go the right direction. Um, one of the pieces that we also did is set aside what are our non-negotiables as a team, and this came out of the PLC Institute. So the posters behind you, or the posters on the side of the slide, um, what do we believe in as a school? We believe in student learning. We're committed to the collective inquiry. Um, we can't do this by ourselves. And collectively as a team, both in our grade levels and across the stool, school, we will be focused on those results. Then out of that, you're going to hear the teacher leader speak to this, is the four essential questions. Um, and when we left the PLC Institute in June, um, I thought about we should make these really quality looking posters. But it's the grit of the work that speaks to the work. So these two posters still hang in our conference room and we go back to these questions. What do we want all students to learn? How will we know they've learned it? What are we going to do if they haven't? And what are we going to do if they already know this content? Um, in a school like Chinook Trail, both of those last questions are essential. We have to take the kids who are still struggling, but we also have to have dedicated time to the kids who are exceeding and know that content or they're not going to show the growth as well. Um, and our why, I'm going to have Corinne share. Hi, everyone. So as we looked at our, oh, sorry, can you hear me now? As we looked at our why, we wanted to really look at those numbers. And behind every number in our school is a child. And behind every child is a story and what they need and how they can succeed. So Mr. Shoemaker worked relentlessly with our team to make sure that we knew what those percentages meant. Because a percentage is a number, but a kid's in your classroom. And that's what really matters. So when we look at those, we identified that our beginning of the year data, when we looked at that Dibbles 8 and really looked at that ELA, we saw that we had 80 students in our school, just 80, that we need to move and we need to pinpoint and focus on. And so while we look at that, every time we come together as a coalition, every time we come together with Kid Talks, when we have those PLC meetings and we know those students and we know how to address those needs, we're also looking at how to move any kid from one band of growth to another and how we can do that. And each one of these teammates behind me and every teacher in our school has that focus on how they can move student growth. We also looked at our math data. And with math being, we had a new curriculum last year, we had different things coming into play. How can we move those students? When we look at those numbers that show where our students are in that low to low average growth, we see that we have 100 students who met that. So we have 100 students in math across grade levels who we're going to move to those exceeding and high or average above growth standards. We also are looking at those students who need to move further. So when we see those and when we see that numbers aren't just numbers, they're kids in our class and they're how we can move them, it makes this PLC work, not only a work that we need to do academically, but a work of heart. So looking at our work, this is how we were able to collaborate not only with other schools, but with our district. So um, not by intention, but as a happenstance um, in the collaboration across our principal network, our partner school in Ranch, our partner school in Wolf Ranch, Ranch Creek Elementary, led by Carrie Adams, um, also sent a guy or a team to the PLC Institute. Not the same one we went to, they went in July. And when we got back together, our teams were so excited, but we're like, we have to leverage this across the staff. So we sh um, dedicated a day of pre-opening um, of our pre-opening week in August, where we got both schools together, um, led by the math work in our curriculum instruction department. And together, um, in grade level teams across schools, we mapped out essential standards and skills um, for the year. And then at the end of the day, we um, did a survey of the teachers, because Carrie and I thought this was a great idea, but if our staffs didn't buy in, this was not going to be productive, and we'd never done it before. And we went to each team, and they said, we have to keep this work up. So we got together for the, a half a day in September on a professional learning day and the teams went back at it. We set up a Teams, a Microsoft Teams. Um, I am not great at the tech piece, a Microsoft team. 
where they have a collaborative folder now going back and forth between schools. So our teachers come up with a common form and assessment or tweak an assessment, it goes into the folder. Their teachers are doing the same um, and it's going back and forth between cross across uh, sites. And that's how we're gonna get really sustainable results and leveraging and more great minds beyond our work. Um, and Brian and Tacey and their team really led that work for us. And without their focus as well on math, um, it's really set us up for success this year. Right. So looking at that master schedule, Mr. Shoemaker talked a little bit about it, but we had this PLC conference. We went to it. We heard from the greatest of the greats and every single one of them said, let you have to do PLC every week. For an hour, you have to get it done. Well, when you're moving 630 kids around a school and you're trying to hit everything you can, you can understand that sometimes we just don't have that. So we thought, how can we make that happen? Our specials teachers have the students for an hour on the Fridays that we don't have that amazing two hour chunk of time. So these teachers do get their PLC time every single week for at least an hour. During that time, we've also incorporated where we're sharing students. We're looking at students in different ways. The counselors dive in, our STEAM teacher dives in, I dive in, our Dean dives in, and we just make it a group effort because we know that the work that the two wonderful ladies behind me and the rest of our staff are doing is worth it. We also made sure that we increased our ELA time and our math Monday through Thursday, and we made sure that we tried to optimize that morning whole group instruction because that's when students are the freshest, that's when we're the freshest, and that's when the best time that we can learn and that tier, tier one instruction can occur. And then on Fridays, what we did is we gave that time so that teachers can do catch up time, deep dive on topics, go into a lab or a unit, get some of that really integrated work done and respond to data in real time so that they have that time with their students on Friday to do what they have to do, what they do best and why they are the professionals who are behind me. And so with that, now you get the real stars of the show and I will introduce Cynthia Edgar, our first grade teacher. Hello. Our story at Chinook, well, I want to talk about my story and what that means for me. At, a, at Chinook Trail Elementary, we, at my team, first grade, we have those four essential questions guiding every thought that we put towards every student. Four questions are, as a reminder, what do we want students to learn and, how, and what do we want them to be able to do? How will we know if, we, if they know it? What are we doing as educators to understand that they really do know it? What are we going to do for the students that do not meet those expectations? And how are we going to excel those students that have already been proficient in those skills? With that, within our first grade team, we have teacher created common for formative assessments. With that, we are able to view our students and their data with the using our, our skills, our knowledge as teachers to be able to create those common formative assessments that match our curriculum, that are targeted to the skills that we are wanting our students to learn. Every Friday, we are focused with immediate and relevant data. What that means is every Friday with those hour or two hours, we are taking tests from that week. We are looking at the data. We are looking at students that need assistance, like I said, whether intervention or to extend. We are inviting teachers in. We are creating that collaborative community that PLC truly is. We are able to have our flexible grouping. Our small groups are not just set. With our collaborative, um, with our collabor collaboration within our teams, we are able to make our groups more fluid and more flexible and really meet each student with each skill that they are needing to be successful. As a professional, this has sparked growth within our team, within our school. It has made us data hungry. We are wanting to know more about our students. How can we make them be successful? Doesn't matter what part of life they are or where they're landing on a score. How can we still push every single student, 100% of our students forward? With that, that's just our school. Like Mr. Shoemaker said, we have extended that to Ranch Creek as well. Using the knowledge, the skills, the professionals of both schools, we have been able to collaborate. We have been able to share our best practices with each other. 
we are able to share ideas, uh, results, and we are able to make sure not just 100% of our students in our school, but our district. And now we are starting to feel that the, the data hunger throughout our district. And now these are not just our students that are actually not, these are our students in District 20, and we take responsibility for that. And we are proud of it. And moving on with our intermediate teacher is the center here. Thank you. Perfect. All right, so first of all, thank you for giving us your time and really honoring the fact that we take these two hours every other Friday very seriously and we put in the work. Um, and I just wanna give credit to the schedule that we were given so that we can work PLCs every week. It's not only uh, hurry up and get everything done in this two hours, but it's continued growth and progress every week as we move through with our teams. Um, and it's tough stuff. Uh, when we came out of our PLC conference on in July or in June, um, I really left with this feeling of we as teachers can come out and make really beautiful lesson plans. And we have all of these wonderful ideas that we can share with kids. And a lot of times we are providing them an opportunity to learn. Sometimes we fall short on ensuring that they're actually learning. So with this idea, with collaborating with our teams, we're moving from that the end summative assessment where we look back and we say, hey, what could we have done better or what would we do differently next time? And say, hey, today, this formative assessment that we purposely planned didn't work out well. What did you do? How can I fix it? How can I meet my kid right here today where they are? And it is just kind of, it's tiring and it's hard work and it's, we have to keep up with it every day. Every week we're meeting, we're making sure that we're staying up on our data, but we collaborate uh, so fluidly that we switch kids in different classrooms. We know them by name. We know them by their skill ability. And I can say, hey, you know, I noticed emotionally you're not here today. What can we do to help you or how can we facilitate this? And it's not just like they were saying data or numbers, but hey, it's a relationship and it's how can we get you to that next band or growth or how can we re remediate for you? Um, and the flexibility of uh, getting that time on Friday within our schedule has been so helpful. We have really great weeks where Fridays can be celebration days. And we have really great weeks where Fridays we have to dig deeper and say, what can we do differently because it didn't land. And having that flexibility and it kind of takes away the stress and it gives us an opportunity to innovate. That um, uh, example that they did today was a beautiful opportunity of cross-curricular stuff and being able to utilize different skills and arts to reach kids on an entirely different level. Uh, and so I love that. And I think that really helps impact our professional um, impact as we're moving forward, not only as a team, but as individuals. And we can say, hey, I'm gonna be authentic with you and that's not my area of strength. I need you to help me because I am really struggling, but I want to do better for my kids. I want to show up on a different level for my kids. And it's really provided an opportunity for our kids to see us as humans saying, hey, we're trying something and it might be messy and it might totally fail and we're going to persevere and we're going to try together and we're going to grow it as a team. So thank you again. Fridays are not just, hey, we're going to show up and get coffee um, and chat because trust me, there's coffee. Don't 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 worry. However, it we put in the work and it's really tiring and we love the outcome and the community that we're seeming to build. So. So that's our story, and with as Chinook, we always have a tie up with our themes. So we take it learning to infinity and beyond this year. <laughs> or do you have any questions? I know this is just part of the comments, but I, I just, my heart was just like singing the whole time you guys were uh, sharing because it's just, uh, this is such important part of our work together as a district and at your school. So, Board, do you have any questions? I mean, Mr. Tembe. So this is for the teachers. Um, <clears throat> is it safe to say it's liberating as an educator to get out of the silo of just doing what you do in a classroom by yourself? Now you've got PLC time with where you're learning best practices from peers, Ranch Creek. Would you say it has been a great professional development opportunity for you? Uh, I'm gonna be totally honest. It was really scary to step out. Comfort is easy and it's something you know. And so stepping into an opportunity of sharing, it's 
trying to create a discussion and what does this look like for us? We have no idea. And getting creative is not something that has always been natural. And so I think getting that chance to actually collaborate has grown us as individuals and professionals in a very different note, I would say it's super exciting. And the reason why is because I'm able to step out of just my classroom and realize I actually have a huge community here that I can learn from, that I could teach, that I could guide, that the cadet could just impact students more than just in my classroom. And it's really cool because I can impact more than just my classroom. Mm -hmm. And it has become truly a community, not like I said, not just within our school, but we're seeing that now across schools within the district. And it's it gives me fun, fuzzy feelings. <laughs> and I can't wait to have more. So yeah, I love it. Well, thanks for what you do. Mr. Salt. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you guys for coming in and talking about this. I also wanted to commend you. Um, changing your master schedule and doing some things a little different is risky and it's uncomfortable, but I really appreciate that you were willing to do that. And, you know, to you, Pat and, and team for, for kind of steering that way, but the rest of the team for, you know, joining on board and, and latching onto that vision and moving behind it. Um, I am really excited to hear how this is going to play out. I'm really excited about this and really appreciate you guys being here tonight. So thank you for taking the risk for our students and really embracing this. Ms. Clemenger. Um, I could say a lot of things because <laughs> this is a school near and dear to me. My children went through it. And um, <clears throat> I know you personally. Um, and so I know what that takes. And I will say, Pat, I don't think that you give yourself enough credit because it does come from leadership down. And Corinne stepping into that new role, it is a leadership down. Um, um, situation and I'm just I'm very grateful to you and like uh, Mr. Salt was saying one time I sat through a, a SAC meeting um, <clears throat> with Mr. Shoemaker and he was talking about we are a high high achieving school and what does that look like when we start getting these CMAS datas and different things like that and we start to say okay inevitably something's going to have to maybe drop or do so, you know things like that and by changing around and having intentional pieces around math and ELA where we are struggling as a district or that we have needs that you see. I think that's commendable and I would take all of you home with me. Mr. Salt. I had one question that I totally forgot about earlier on and then I got totally sidetracked with, you know, Buzz and Woody over here. Um, so you had your 80 kids in the one group and the 100 in the other. I was just curious if those overlap or if they're disparate groups? Both um, and more so in the middle grades. Um, you see, well, if we, our kindergarten slides were very, our kindergarten class was heavy, like 21% with reading. Um, that's because we haven't taught them sounds yet. So a lot of those will drop quickly, um, but only six of them in math. So there you don't see a lot. When you get to the upper grades um, by fifth grade, there's a handful that are in both, but by there, kids are typically, and what I was showing is, they're struggling one area or the other. I could be in take flight right now working on reading skills, but I'm fine in math. So, hmm. but second, third, that's probably where we see the most correlation between the two. Thank you. Yep. Thank you all. That, that was great. I really appreciate it. I know you guys, you all do great work. So thank you so much. About building the next generation of leaders because this guy with gray hair won't be here forever and I say that sincerely because if this PLC time these folks would not be here tonight um, and it was a big risk and they did an amazing job and when you see great leadership across your school and you can empower not just a few but across the grade level that is also how we're going to sustain things in this district because we have to create the next generation and that's where they are a good yeah a good leader trains up leaders so when they leave uh, nothing you know you don't skip a beat so very good great thank you you guys go <laughs> yep. consent agenda we need a motion to approve the following resolutions resolution 294 23 approval of matters relating to administrative staff classified resolution 295 23 approval of matters relating to staff specialist staff 
Resolution 29623, approval of matters relating to licensed staff teachers. Resolution 29723, approval of matters relating to licensed staff, license support slash special services provider. Resolution 29823, approval of matters relating to classified staff and the approval of the Board of Education regular meeting minutes from September 7th, 2023. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger? Aye. Mrs. Cons? Aye. Mr. Lavalli? Aye. Mr. Salt? Aye. Mr. Temby? Aye. We have six people uh, listening on uh, on the uh, internet today, tonight. Uh, there are no items pulled from consent. So next is summer program 2023 summary report. Superintendent Haber. Yes, and uh, I'd like for um, Dr. Susan Field, Assistant Superintendent of Learning Services. Good evening. So this evening we have three spectacular presenters. Joe Royer, who is the head of summer school. Andy Reskin, who is the director for literacy and Martha Henson, who is going to talk about summer counseling. Good evening. Nice to piggyback on all that success. And uh, I'm a data dog, so I like people talking about data and using it for the right purposes. Good evening. You know summer school. Uh, this is my sixth year working with the summer program. We had a great year. Most people don't realize that. In the summertime, we're the largest institution in Colorado Springs, over 2,000 kids. Uh, you're familiar with the format? Uh, I'll go through it. If you have questions, please let me know. But you can see we had almost 70 teachers employed, 2,000 kids, six site coordinators, two high school counselors, and had a lot of programs. At the bottom, I quickly will show you the highlighted, the 110, 60, 74. Those are the tuition prices. What's following is the, the feathering in of the tuition to get to pre-COVID levels that you see at the end. We've offset the uh, tuition rates by using the ESSER funds. Summer school offerings, you can see preschool, elementary, middle school, high school. Um, high school, we offered almost 50 different classes, French, Spanish, pre-calculus, uh, English one, two, three, four. So you can see what we offered for kids. Uh, a lot of success. Elementary growing again. Uh, great work from Becky Allen and Cameron Smart. We're able to get our summer school salaries kind of comparable to where I thought they should have been. And through some great work, we were able to, in, in your approval, get salaries up for summer school and teachers certainly appreciated that. You can see our trends in summer school. We are starting to go. And I would imagine we pick up another 150 in elementary next year because I've already talked to quite a few teachers. And you can see our high school. Our high school is just is just taken off. And what's amazing about it, it's it's changed. It's flipped. It's no longer credit recovery. I failed. I take summer school. Six years ago, you go back and look, it was 65 credit recovery, 35 advance. Now it's advanced. All these kids are advanced taking math to get out of faster track. If you're a high school principal, you're loving it. We want kids in algebra two coming in as a freshman at a minimum. PE, taking, taking PE credit so they can have another elective AP class, graduating early, but this has been a really joy for me to watch this take place. Um, grade level distribution, this is, whoops, gotta go the other way, following Patrick. Um, grade level distribution, these are kids that are you know going into grades. So kids going into 12th grade, 35% of our kids were going into 12th grade. So you can see that 34%, 10th grade, 19% of 10th graders. Those kids are all really getting advanced. Those are math, those are PE kids. Ninth grade, ninth graders coming into ninth grade. They haven't have a high school credit yet. 11% so trying to get ahead. So it's really changed and it's, it's really, I think, seen in some of the success the high schools are having. Summer school class distribution. You can see where they take, 38% taking math, 23% taking PE. I want to get PE out of the way so I can take another AP class down the road. So I can take another um, music class or I can graduate early or I can take my core classes and go take a, an AV class or vocational class off campus. So it's really taking place. And that's with counselors doing great work at the high school, getting kids ready and prepared. Language arts, 17, Spanish two, and science, 10%. Graduation, I mean, excuse me, a school grade distribution. Great to have kids taking school, but how, how successful we are. Teachers work hard, do a great job. Counselors do a great job. Uh, this was the highest success rate we've had in the last six years. We were pushing 97%. And then feedback from kids basically was, hey, I have one class, I focus on one class. Teachers are with me, my site coordinators calling parents. We're collectively working with parents. They hear from the teacher, they hear from the site coordinator, they hear from me. So we, we bang on the death. I probably made over 200 calls just myself. And uh, that's it. Questions you might have for me. 
at summer school. Just a quick one on the uh, fee schedule. So was that three years of reduced fees from ESSER funds and then what we're going to go well, back to? Two more years. We'll, we'll feather in here, then we'll feather one more time, then we will go back to the. And that and that was the list. Yes, ma'am. It was three years ago. Yep. Or two, okay, I just want to understand. Thank you. Certainly, good, great question. Other questions you might have. Super. Thank you very much. Oh, <coughs> Hold on, Please. Conjure. Sorry, I just put a grape. In my mouth. <laughs> I was just going to say I visited the summer schools both sessions, and I thought they were so fantastic. And it, it was I obviously did more of the elementary level, but it was um, so well received, and I just appreciated all of your effort. A lot of fun. And your and your gal that keeps you in line. Oh yes. I can't remember her name. Amy, Amy thank you. That was good to have yeah. you in class. Yeah, Joe and I get to share Amy. She keeps us both in line. So, all right, moving on to our reading program. Pause for the class. It was the same slide deck as the last one. It was tacked on. Oh, I don't want to. Yeah, no. I can't do that. All right. Summer reading program looking specifically at our K3 reading um, tutoring and support. Um, you can see we had actually about 50 students less than last year. Um, between our school programs and our district facilitated programs, but we did reach 221 students, um, which was great. Um, this summer was funded by ESSER grant as well. Um, next year, there's a possibility that we can still tap into some ESSER, but um, I'll talk a little bit more about um, family buy-in later because um, we are still having a bit of an issue with attendance, so I'll talk about that. Um, it was again six weeks. We really focused on kindergarten through th third grade students. Um, students who participated in the district program were referred to us from schools um, and they were really focusing on students that were behind. Um, but there was also a piece where we wanted to really talk with families and make sure that they could attend and wanted to attend. Um, so those referrals came to us and then we really worked as a literacy department to um, create targeted groups with gr our great 10 licensed teachers who did a great job with them this year. Um, attendance, so we had the 101 students who attended um, the district program, 58 students were able to attend both sessions and 40 three attended the June or the July sessions, so those three weeks. But really, when we looked at the whole summer program, we had about a 56% attendance rate. And I think um, a few factors that played into that is that it's not their home school, typically, so they're driving or commuting. And commuting itself isn't necessarily a problem, but it's not that same connection and feel to your home school. Um, along those lines, it's not that teacher you know. Um, so when your child wakes up on a summer morning and it was a late night having fun and maybe they won't, you know, went ahead to reading, it's a little easier maybe to say, yeah, we'll go tomorrow. We've had all week. Um, some. Um, Ms. Ruskin, I, yeah. if, if uh, Ms. Conjur has a question. Um, I noticed that that was one of the questions that you had talked about was the um, attendance or the reading maybe being s smaller this year and I, I don't know but as I was reading that and reading through this I thought you know we've come into a I think a season of people being th that they're traveling more too and I think there was a lot more travel this summer than in the previous because of pandemic or whatever reasons but I feel like this was a much more well-traveled summer and that could have played into it too obviously I don't know but that was just something I was thinking 100%. We did track reasons why students didn't come and certainly travel was something we heard more of this year than previously. That was also a reason why um, families didn't participate in total as well because they were going to be gone um, during the summer. So that's not all bad. Um, but we really are looking closely at that. I kind of put up some successes in areas for improvement and we really want to be wise with our funds 
ESSER or otherwise. Um, and we're really doing that kind of cost benefit analysis. We did great work with the kids that we saw. Teachers built great connections. Reading was fun and targeted. Um, so all good things, but attendance rate was, I, I don't consider 56% great. Um, progress monitoring data shows as last year, it's very mixed results. We have students who at the beginning of the year when we compared their end of year score to beginning, some students went down, some remained about the same, a handful went up, you know, a little bit. So it's, it's just hard to, as far as a cost benefit analysis, we really are looking for other ways to reach and grow students um, in a smarter way. Um, so some ideas for improvement. Um, one really just parent registration, right? So when a parent makes the call instead of a teacher asking you if you'll please attend, I don't know about you, it's like when I go to the dentist and they ask me if I'm flossing, I say, you bet, every day. I'd love to come to reading tutoring in the summer. It's hard to say no because they want that for their children, but they also know how demanding, thankfully, summers can be. So if parents choose um, reading support in the summer, we think that, you know, that might help. Um, we have kind of piggybacked on Joe's great program, but I think we want to integrate more and have it be not just kind of that hour targeted tutoring, but how can we make the whole time about reading and fun and learning and skills? Um, we want to perhaps offer tutoring at more school sites so students are going to their home school for tutoring. And we also realizing that families do travel and honestly that is a great experience for our kids to really live life and learn things and build their background knowledge so that the, when they learn reading skills in, in school, um, they can attach those new skills to something. Um, we want to look at offering that online program, but not just here, practice online. How can we incentivize it? So weekly, you're seeing face-to-face -face interaction with teacher. You can show me all you learned. We can apply some of that practice. Um, so those are some ideas that we're looking to improve. Ms. Cloninger. Um, I was just wondering if you had um, taken some of the um, practices that PPLD had done with the reading incentivizing for that you know, younger crowd. Yeah. Is that something that you guys are able to do where you're able to, you know, do little coupons or whatever? I, I, it's something we're definitely looking at. I think it can, it's amazing what a slice of pizza can do or um, coins or stickers or honestly just getting together with your peers and having a book celebration. Um, so I think it's one thing to say practice at home and we'll see you in August, you know, I don't know about you, but there's some immediate rewards and celebrations along the way we think we'll do better than just practice online and we'll see you in August. Any other questions? Mr. Salt. Thank you. Uh, when, when are these offered? Is it always at the same time or do we have multiple sessions throughout the day? So we have like a morning session and an afternoon session that might make it easier. That's a great question. We, because we um, partner with Joe, there's two sessions in the morning. So his program is about three hours long. We squeeze in an hour and then we switch our kids and we do another hour. So it's in that morning block. Um, and we really do our best to try and meet the needs of families um, as far as which time frame will work best for them, but it's not always ideal. There's a lot of sports that happen in the summer as well. Um, and those earlier hours are better for all that outdoor sweaty stuff. <laughs> Anything else? All right. Yes, good time. Hi, I'm Martha Henson. I'm a therapist at our Family Resource Counseling Center here in Academy District 20. So we've had a fun, exciting summer. We um, we did summer counseling groups again this year. Uh, we actually started these back during um, COVID just to get the kids around and I was part of that. And I remember um, Maureen telling us that, um, or maybe it was Becky, they, they said, okay, we have to keep them six feet apart and we all have to wear a mask. And I remember in Spruce, like having like literally kids on every, part of the room trying to do a counseling group where they couldn't be close together. 
it's come a long way from there. But anyway, we had 102 students um, who participated in our summer counseling groups. 50 were elementary. Uh, we had 35 middle and 17 high school students. We uh, conducted these with six of our FRC therapists and four of our D20 LPC candidates. Um, and um, the groups met twice a week. Uh, for three weeks, uh, six sessions in all at Academy Endeavor. So we did that um, June 5th through the 22nd. And you may be asking, what are the four ASD 20 LPC candidates? So at the FRC, we have a truly wonderful program. It's the Counseling Supervision Candidate Program. So whenever, um, let's say, a school counselor or a school social worker, or even a school psychologist wants to pursue their professional therapy um, license. There are a lot of pretty strenuous requirements. One of them um, is 100 hours of direct supervision. So we have two therapists that um, are licensed to do supervision. And um, so any of our school counselors or social workers can um, uh, apply for that program and actually volunteer for things like summer groups and they get direct supervision and they're able to obtain their hours that way free. 25 years ago when I got my licensed professional counselor license, I paid $50 a week for almost two years. That was a big chunk of change back then. Um, I can't even imagine what it is right now. I'm sure it's close to 100 um, per hour. So this is a great, um, program that we can help grow our um, mental health professionals and also give them um, a way to work with students in a different capacity. So, and they all were just phenomenal. I think they're going to make great therapists. Ms. Collinger? Yes. I have a bunch of questions because I, I really like this part, but um, <laughs> have you ever thought of doing it at different locations? just because that's, it's generally done here, right? Um, for the summer program is what I was trying to say. Right, actually this year we did it at Academy Endeavor. Oh, you did? We did last year as well, because it's right beside our our portable. Oh, I thought it was here, so that's that good. Were. No, but you know, I do think we might have, um, we served 102 students, but much more than that registered, they just didn't show up. Yep. So I think as, what um, Andy was saying with the reading program that families have good intentions, but they're not going to their home school. And so that can feel a little nerve wracking, especially the first day for those students. So that first day we do so much welcoming and getting to know you games and fun stuff so that they will come back, right? <laughs> so as far as our topics for those summer counseling groups, we get feedback from school counselors uh, uh, across the board, elementary, middle, high, as to what the highest needs are, as well as our own data of kids that are being referred to our center. So in elementary, it was uh, feelings and emotions, um, particularly emotional regulation. In middle, it was dealing with anxiety and interpersonal skills in order to have more positive interactions with their peers. And in high school, it was dealing with anxiety and depression. Um, you might want to know how uh, students can join these groups. So in May, we do send out um, an email across the board to all of our school counselors to share the times, the topics, and um, all of that information. And that gives them the chance to um, uh, talk with students and parents that they feel could benefit from some of these groups. Um, we also send out a D20 alert and we get uh, with a link to register that way um, that parents can just register their kids from there. So and lastly, finally, we did transition workshops. This was a new um, opportunity we provided our students this year for our rising sixth and um, sixth grade and rising ninth grade. Um, I was actually in charge of this and um, two nights before it started, I had an emergency appendectomy. So I did not get to participate and see it, but I did all the planning for it so I can talk to it. But this ended up being a great, great two days. Uh, we did this August 9th 
um, for all the sixth graders that registered and August 10th for all the rising ninth graders from nine to 12. We had 136 sixth graders and that was the first day of registration. So we had to cut it off and we started a wait list. But if any of you were here that day, I understand that there was a line all the way out the parking lot down to um, Jamboree over here of students waiting to get in. So um, that was a great day, a little challenging for all of our therapists, but I think they did a great job. Um, in ninth grade, we had 60 students um, and that were um, joining with us. The topics were we uh, did self-advocating with teachers because we know that's a huge need in middle and high school. That was one station. Uh, we had time management. That was another station kind of with organization. We did stress management as well as um, interpersonal skills and just helping kids to have more positive interactions with their peers. So it ended up being um, a really wonderful thing, a heartwarming story. One of our therapists tells is on the sixth grade day, she noticed um, in her session that these, this girl went up to another girl. We had them grouped by schools so that they could meet new people. And um, she asked this girl she would like to sit with her and go through the stations with her. And at the very end, as they're walking out the door, the therapist overheard the girl say, and will you be my, my very best friend when we start school next week? And so, you know, I just have to, I get chills because that's the sense of belonging that kids are looking for. And that's part of the anxiety of going to sixth and ninth grade is going to these bigger schools, new place, lots more responsibility. And just to have that sense of belonging makes all the difference. So with that said, do you have any questions for me? Thank you, Ms. Hanson. Hey, okay, that's a good thing. Thank you. <laughs> So I, and I apologize, this might be for Ms. Ruskin, I, I apologize. I, I had um, a question about the, um, how are students chosen for the district-wide reading program versus the individual school reading programs? Sure, great question. So as far as the district-wide, um, most of those students come from schools that aren't having their own program. And they are, they first look at their, well, they look at reading data, particularly K3 and those students well below. So then they talk to those families and if families are able and wanting to participate in tutoring, those names come to the literacy team. Um, at that point, we group students into targeted groups and reach back out to families and, and set that up, set up tutoring. School-based programs, I honestly don't have the specifics about how they choose kids. A lot of it is the same kind of parameters. They look for kids who need the additional support. Can families make it? Um, and then they open their doors. And the difference is that we really have that targeted one-hour blocks with students, and we keep our groups at five. Our school programs look um, different depending where you are. Chinook Trail does kind of a jump start. Um, where kids come in and they work with teachers. We have High Plains that has a program that goes on for about three weeks, half days. Um, so depending on the school, um, they might approach the learning differently and use, typically they use the programs I've used all year long and just keep on hammering out those, that knowledge and skills. Super, and um, you know, since I had one quick question, and I, I think you kind of answered it. I assume the students who were selected for counseling, it was purely parents saying, I want my child to do that. Do, do we do any sort of, hey, we'd like your child to be in? Kind of field. Um, prepare school counselors so that they can recommend kids to come to group and we get lots of calls and we'll we'll sign them up that way as well and then we offer it to parents for registration so super thank you yeah you're welcome thank you thank you Ms. Ruskin as well all right next one up is monitoring report for executive limitation policy 2.2 treatment of parents and general public superintendent Haber 
Yes, and I'd like Dr. Jim Smith, Assistant Superintendent for Planning and Engagement to come to mic. All right, good evening. It's my pleasure to open discussion about this year's Executive Limitations 2.2 Treatment of Parents and General Public Monitoring Report. This report covers from August 25, 2022, uh, to August 30th, 2023, and spans both Mr. Gregory's tenure as well as the beginning of um, Ms. Haber's tenure as well. Throughout the report, I highlighted each of the four policy provision statements and how each of them have been addressed to guarantee that the superintendent is in compliance. The statement reads, the superintendent will not cause or allow conditions, procedures, or decisions that are unclear, unfair, unsafe, untimely, undignified, unresponsive or unnecessarily intrusive. Lots of uns there. Do you have any questions for me? We'll say no. Jim, I'll just say that this seemed more, um, the examples and the evidence yes. seemed kind of more robust. So thanks. Very good. There was just a lot of data. Ms. Haber and I worked on that for yes. part of <laughs> part, so. And and just to share, I mean, I, I kind of want to share with the public that um, in our in our study session, we're going to continue doing these reporting this way so that we can differentiate between Superintendent Haber and our previous superintendent so we can see data for both. So absolutely updating and modifying. It. Yeah, it's great. I, I'm Ms. Clunter. Sorry, I was just going to say we also had a conversation about this in our study session, and so it is also part of why we are more silent right now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith. All right, we have the MRE or EL 2.2. Is the superintendent's interpretation of the policy reasonable? Is there sufficient evidence to determine compliance for each section? Are all sections in compliance? Recognition of exemplary performance or concerns regarding performance. I think Dr. Smith did an outstanding job uh, of that briefing. <laughs> all right, um, preparation for next. I'm being facetious there. OK, you can figure that. Would you like to see additional different evidence or should any part of this policy be changed in the next monitoring report cycle? Do you see any evidence which is extraneous or no longer necessary? Next up on the agenda is the 2023 CASB Delegate Assembly and Legislative Resolution Discussion. Mr. Salt. Oh, hold on. I thought we were doing financial. Did I? Yes, I, I flat out missed Sorry. it. I, I, that is my apologies. Mr. Salt, you're on, a, you're on deck, but you're not up yet. Monthly financial report through August 2023, Superintendent Haber. Yes, I'd like for Ms. Becky Allen, Chief Financial Officer, to come to the mic. Good evening. What you have in front of you is our first monthly financial report for our new fiscal year 23-24 through the end of August. If you take a look at page three, you'll see table one and looking at letter A in the blue box, you can see as of the end of August, we've collected about 11% of our revenue, which is slightly higher than last year at this time. Also on table one, on page three, looking at letter B in the blue box. Oh, we're all having some difficulties. All right, thank you. <laughs> looking at letter B in the blue box, expenses are at 16.8% as compared to just under 16% last year, shown in the green box. Looking at page eight, you'll see graph five, which compares our resources and our expenditures. And you can see that our resources exceed expenditures by about $36 million as shown by the gap. Just a brief update on our end of year unassigned fund balance from 22-23. So our mid-year budget, the actual budget, the mid-year adjusted budget, shows an ending unassigned fund balance of $29.2 million. However, the work that we are doing, we are now auditing last year, we're looking at our actuals, and it's looking more to be like 39 million. So we will be coming to you with all of those actuals at the mid-year time in January. Just remember, that is my best guess at this point. It could change a little bit, but again, I will true that up for you when I come back uh, in January with that mid-year budget. Any questions for me? 
Mr. Salt. Thank you. Uh, we don't have this graph in your display deck, but it was in the report that you provided. Yes. Um, you had, sorry, I'm trying to pull up my, my question or my thing here. Um, so we had graph number six, and then last year we sort of went kind of level a little up. Yes. This year we had a pretty drastic drop, yes. which se te seemed to follow sort of the year over year trend that you had as well. Yes. I was just curious what the difference was between last year and this year. Absolutely. And when I saw this graph, I was too also uh, curious. So in July, if you look at the graph, there's about a $6.7 million difference between what was in our bank account, our available, available cash in July of 22, it was less in July 2023. In July of 2022, we received our ECEA dollars, which is our state special education funding, 6.7 million. This year we got it in August. So you see, and when you look at the graph, you see it recovers in August. It just came earlier in that prior year. I assumed it had something to do with the deposit or something that, that changed, but I just wasn't yeah. sure what it was. So thank Great you. Question. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Now we're doing the 2023 CASB Delegate Assembly and Legislative Resolution Discussion. And Ms. Stone, why don't you kind of talk about what this is and why we're doing this? Sure. So um, CASB is the Colorado Association of School Boards and every year, every uh, member district, which is most of the districts in Colorado, have an, a delegate that is assigned from the district to go to this delegate assembly. And so we vote on things, uh, bylaw changes, um, which Mr. Timby's on the task force right now they're reviewing. We vote on um, these resolutions, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, we vote on board members and, and other kind of business items with sort of the, the business arm of CASB. Uh, the, every year in October, uh, we have this delegate assembly meeting where we go through and so we solicit resolutions from member districts from across the state. Every district has the opportunity to submit resolutions that then go on to this delegate assembly in October. Uh, the body either approves them or rejects those resolutions and then the approved resolutions basically become the lobbying platform for CASB as we move into the legislative session. And so many of these resolutions that we'll talk about tonight talk about CASB's stance of doing this or CASB's desire to do that. And so um, I am our delegate uh, this year out to CASB. And so I'll be going to this uh, conference in October. And so what we're doing tonight is going through, there's about 36-ish uh, resolutions that have been submitted. Some of them are standing resolutions. And so just FYI, I wasn't going to talk about the standing resolutions. They're typically things like, please uh, fully fund education and <laughs> you know, basic things that, that pretty much everyone stands behind here. We have them both at the state level and the federal level. And so I typically, I was planning on skipping those and moving straight into the, um, the actual resolutions that were submitted. Uh, I was going to do consent because there are a couple that I wanted to, to chat about. Um, so it's broken down into consent, just like what we have here uh, in our board meetings. We have a consent agenda. We have consent resolutions that are one. There is a um, legislative arm uh, board committee within CASB, and they review all of these resolutions beforehand. When they effectively have a unanimous decision of saying, yes, this is something that CASB intends to support, or we as a legislative committee support, it goes on to the consent, resol uh, the consent portion of the uh, consent resolution. Um, for sort of the broad thing. Now, just like here, if we have resolutions that we don't tend to subscribe to, uh, any member can remove those from the consent agenda so that they can be discussed and debated on the floor and brought to a vote there and pulled off of the consent. So um, that's kind of where we are. So I was going to start, the one that I had was consent agenda resolution number two. Um, this was referendum to mirror initiative 63. Initiative 63 was a ballot initiative last year that failed. That was around retaining TABOR dollars to help fund teacher salaries long-term. And so I wanted to bring this because this was something that the voters rejected last year. And so for us to push this back and say we want to do it again, to me felt a little pushy. So I was planning on not supporting that one, pulling it from consent. 
and hey, let's Aaron, just make this a yeah sure. let's just all talk as as we go so Aaron it looks like the committee advanced that kind of in the face of it in the face of it failing so any insight I have not spoken to any of the committee members about this we'll have I'm We'll have discussions around it. Right. Uh, so I'll be last year. I just went up just for the assembly portion. This year I'm going for the entire uh, conference. There's a little bit of a conference on Friday with the intent to try to talk to other members, uh, other delegates around some of these things to, to see if there's some context uh, that we can get and really just dialogue about it before we get to the floor debate. So their aim is to move this to the 24 ballot general election. They're wanting resurrect the. It. They're wanting to resurrect this. They're wanting the legislation, legislation, legislators to. Oh, I'm struggling tonight. Uh, the legislators to resurrect this and, and put this back either in the ballot or put it in a state statute. So it definitely warrants discussion, right? I believe it does. Yeah. So that's why I was planning on removing it from consent to to discuss if no one else was willing to do that there. So this was the big one why I wanted to talk about the consent items. Uh, we can. Uh, yeah, so I'll just mark the consent ones that I had questions about. If that works for you, the ones that I skip, I'm just full support on that one so far. Uh, the next one was resolution four. This one didn't really give me. We've talked like last year about having uh, earmarked dollars over open dollars that came in. Are you talking about number four? I'm talking about consent agenda resolution number four. Okay. It's on the screen right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. So this one is another one this is a reauthorization so it was a piece that had kind of sunset and so they're wanting to to bring it back i don't have any hard feelings about this i just know the sport has discussed last year around having earmarked dollars versus open dollars and wanting to make sure we fully fund that i understand the need for rural school funding and so i don't want to do anything that would dampen that so i'm likely supportive of this i just wanted to have the conversation yeah my sense is uh, through the federal relations network um, this one came up and there's a lot of sensitivity with the rural districts in this one. So, so just for what it's worth. Yep. Sensitivity, how so? Uh, continue the funding as an earmark. Okay. Yeah. So. Everyone good with that? Yeah. Okay. Um, so consent agenda resolution number six achieve national average level of public school funding. I think this is a valiant effort, but they don't, I didn't see a whole lot about where this funding's coming from. And so it's great to say fund education more, but if we don't have something behind that to really advance the funding, then it's kind of an empty resolution. It, like it feels good to pass it, but there's no practicality behind it. When I see resolutions that, that they wanna make this to become law and they urge people, that's not law, that's just urging. And I, I always question why that, why we even bother with that kind of thing. These are resolutions, so it's, it, it's just really the platform. So I, I get your your perspective, but anything that we do here is just to urge legislators to ask them to do what we want. Make, make it a priority. Yeah. yeah, so that was my issue with, with number six was really, there's nothing there to talk about where the funding's going to come from, so it feels good, but okay. I think fine. Nine. Uh, I remember talking about nine last year. This is repealing uh, financial penalties penalties applied to K-12 education in the Claire Davis School Safety Act. I remember this came up last year and us having a discussion, but I don't remember if we had any issues about it or not. I didn't have my packet from last year. My thought was we were relatively supportive of this, but I couldn't recall. So I just wanted to make sure that we didn't have any change of heart. And we knew what our heart was. I don't want to put Miss Thompson on the on the hook here. That <laughs> any insight into this one? Well, I think this one is um, really the the. It's really hard considering what the Claire Davis School Safety Act is predicated on. So to speak out and to try to. Um, erode uh, what that intends to address, I think is, is difficult, but nonetheless, I support the efforts by Boulder Valley because um, we all are impacted by trying to um, 
prevent take reasonable steps to prevent any act of school violence. So um, to the extent that we're good actors, I, I guess one would argue that we don't have much to worry about under Claire Davis, but um, the, the, the financial penalties that come with any failure that may be found are very significant and substantial. So is there concern about removing penalty <laughs> and districts having looser policies around that? Like, is, does that remove some of the incentive, I guess, is my question. Can you say that again, Mr. Saul? I just want to make sure I understand your question. Sure. So if we remove, uh, if we lobby here to remove the financial penalties, is that removing any sort of an incentive to make sure that we're following, you know, we being districts being vigilant about that, as Mr. Timmy saying, this is, you know, this is a really, uh, school safety is incredibly important and something that we should all take seriously. I don't want actions that we take removing those penalties to lessen the severity or the, the diligence, the vigilance of districts across the state uh, to, to be in compliance with us. I wanna make sure that there is enough there to make sure that that everyone's doing what they need to do. And so that at the face value, that's kind of my concern here is if we're removing some of the penalty, is that gonna remove um, some of the incentives for vigilance? I think the, the financial penalties is, is what the liability that, that districts try to manage and therefore they they investigate and they look into any matters. Um, and so to remove those penalties, I don't think there's any harm in that. It's really putting a lot of trust back into the system to just do the right thing and to um, investigate, manage those risks without having the But again, it puts the trust back on the system to just do the right thing in these situations. It doesn't preclude any action being taken against the district, right? Correct. From a victim's family. Or that is whatever. correct, yeah. yeah. It just may not give victim's family the, the financial compensation that may be uh, accessible through uh, an action under Claire Davis. Yeah. I, I support this. I remember having a discussion about it last year. I couldn't remember where we landed, so that's why I wanted to make sure that I raised it here. Yeah, I, I think the penalties, in my view, are pretty brutal with Claire Davis. You know, um, the financial penalties, like you said, so. Thanks. Uh, item number 10 was a change to uh, open meetings law allowing uh, districts to cure. Um, the example they give here is misreading uh, CRS title. So uh, Ms. Thompson, I'm assuming we're in favor of this. <laughs> Can shake your head yes fast enough on that one. Uh, no. That was my my assumption. I just want to make sure there's not something that reading it at face value, if there's anything deeper that we need to be concerned about. I have not read this in detail, so it's probably not good for me to say a solid yes or no, but I think um, the opportunity to, to cure is always a good thing to have. And so I can certainly um, not in support of the proposed opportunity to cure for, especially for our school districts. Sure, thank you. Uh, number 11, I was gonna propose uh, an amendment to. I wanted to see what people thought about this. Um, I completely agree here with Boulder Valley that having oversight of the new CDEC department is important. I was going to modify this and I wanted to get people's opinions 
on this, people are much smarter than me, is if there's a reason why it wouldn't just fall under the purview of the CDE, of the State Board of Education effectively, that that would be, we already have this body implemented that oversees the Department of Education, so putting the early childhood in that as well seemed to make sense to me. And so modifying this or amending it to just say that the CDE, we would like to see that the CDEC fall under the same guidance and governance of the State Board of Education. Mr. Salt, may I give my opinion on that? I would love to hear it. I and pose I, it as a question nobody was answering. So any anybody who wants to speak, let's go for it. And I'll defer to Dr. Field on the educational aspect. But from a financial aspect, I think doing that would bring a lot of benefit. What we've seen with universal preschool, to me, there's now two. I don't know at different times who's in charge. And so one jurisdiction might say, point the finger at the one, and no offense, I know they're doing the best they can, but uh, it's been a tumultuous rollout. And I think if it had one umbrella that, and a strict umbrella, instead of these two organizations jockeying back and forth, I think we would have a lot more success, I can say from the financial stance. I can only say as well that my opinion, but again, I'll defer from an educational stance, I'd have more confidence if there were one person in charge or one entity in charge. Dr. Field, did you have anything to add? Sorry, I agree with Becky. It's been, matter of fact, I'm sure you probably know that there are many school districts and case that are suing because it's been not rolled out well. All right, thank you. So, board, are you guys good with me uh, proposing an amendment that would, okay, thank you. All right, now we're moving on to the non-consent agenda, agenda items. So we'll talk about each of these unless, or we can just talk about each of these and go through them. Most of these are pretty quick, I think. Uh, first is universal screeners for reading and math. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is the General Assembly setting aside resources within the READ Act and Math Act in order to provide universal reading and math screeners during early K-12 evidence-based timeframes for best identifying deficiencies. This is another one where I say, I think this is a really, really good effort. Um, I'm concerned about taking money out of READ Act. And, and so this is more of a, let, let's, I'll ask you. Um, taking money out of read act and set it aside for this i'm concerned about the current interventions and current programming that we have in place that that would be jeopardized by that and if there's if we needed a different pot of money that this would come from or a supplement to it but not just sectioning off some of this concern me i would say a different pot of money because through the years we have decreased in funding you know we get a per pupil allocation for the number of students we have on our read plan and it, it, it's around $400 per student right now, but it used to be as high as 800 at one point. So my position then would be a, a fair, a, basically against this, unless we had a different pot of money that could be coming, but we don't want to segment out. We don't want to. Well, especially for math screeners. Yeah. So they need to do a math act. Well, they have that in here. That was uh, they have HB twenty three twelve thirty one Math Act, as an, but it's another pot of money that they're slicing and dicing to make sure that they have the screeners just like they would for the Read Act. And so, again, it goes back to the we've already we already have a certain amount of allocation, and so cutting that and sending that in a different direction gives me a little pause, and that's why I wanted to get a little feedback. So I should have said this earlier. My my general view on laws is a no unless somebody can tell me why it's important so my, my initial going in is no unless it, it can be a good idea and i've always my goal is always to make that school uh colorado schools law book smaller I, I, you know that really I, I mean i'd love to be able to take things out of that so adding things to it unless there's a really good reason so that's my bias my bias is generally not my, my only thing was i said is this necessary that was why i was like what 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 problem are we trying to solve here? Do, do do we need this, Dr. Field? Will this help us 
as as a as a district? A math screener? No, this this yeah this. The state, you know, it's the state sticking its nose in. Sorry, the state telling us what to do again. No, but I don't opinion. want to lose our REDAC money because we use a lot of that money for tutoring. Oh, I, I don't think this this has nothing to do with that. Well, it does. It does. What they're it saying does. passes. What? Yeah, what yeah. they're saying is we're going to take the REDAC pot of money less. and we're going to spec earmark some of those dollars to go to the screener and take that opportunity for the district to to use it how they need to for their students away yeah. for that section. And so. I mean, if they had a different pot of money that was with an identified funding source, I think having screeners would be a great idea. Mr. Saul, I really agree with what you just said. I, in my opinion, from a financial stance, I don't like strings. And when there's requirements, there's strings. We need flexibility because perhaps we have the appropriate benchmark assessments in place which are in essence, you know, two to three times per year are in essence screeners. And so I, if they would like to give us funding, that's wonderful, but I like the maximum flexibility personally. I also think about the flexibility and what kind of screeners we want to use. Because sure. sometimes we'll state, we'll say, well, here's the ones you have to use and they may or may not be as effective as the ones we're already looking at or using. And we've already invested in some of those and it's not only the actual tool, but it's all of the professional learning that accompanies it. And when our teachers, like the fine teachers we had from Chinook Trail, they're very comfortable with that assessment. They're comfortable with the data analysis protocols and they're, they're used to using the data to really inform their instruction. Sometimes that's a tough change when the assessment changes. It's like you have to relearn it a little bit as a teacher and as an administrator. So I just, I agree that if there's only a small limited number of assessments, maybe it's not the assessment we want to use or one that, that uh, would force us to move away from something we're already using. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, next resolution 13, early literacy. Uh, this one just reads as a great idea. Uh, we support legislation that will increase the number of students meeting or exceeding state reading standards. Huzzah, um, but I don't know what that, means I mean they, they list things that down here but not a lot of things that the state uh, legislature one, is actually going to sorry nope. one thing I was going to say and maybe um, superintendent Haver can speak to this too is that some of these read um, I mean obviously we're taking in 178 school districts and so we are talking about people that don't already have a, an extensive learning services group or something like that so I mean some of that I do think just comes into what we already have like she said people that are doing that and being able to read that data. Yeah, I, I looked like explicit intervention recommendations and progress monitoring. Why should the state do that? That's not the state's job, in my opinion. Well, I know that's the standard argument why we have the Department of Education. Well, the states aren't going to do it. Well, I don't know. I, I get frustrated with. But it's also about the size, and I think that we're looking at a lot of different things, and it's not apples to apples across the board, and we are taking in some of those rural districts that are needing, sorry, I keep eating while I'm talking, um, take in some of those things. So, I mean, I think that just shows kudos to the stuff we just learned from our group in our study session, right? So, I'm a, that's me. I respect what you're saying, I just disagree. I just, I'm, I'm oh, you're agreeing with, I thought you were talking about the rural schools. Okay, then I agree with you. I'm going to get some chocolate. I'll be right back. I think all of this falls under local control, and I don't think we need the state telling us what to do with these things because we already have these things in place. And like you're saying, it's it's good to put out there because we have some districts that aren't. But, you know, I don't think that it's the place of the state to, to do this. All right, resolution 14 updates to the PTEC programming. Uh, this was basically making some tweaks to the funding model. Um, if you want to scroll, the so the, the bullets down at the bottom are sort of the improvements that they've identified. It's not actually part of the resolution. The resolution itself is fairly anemic, just saying we want it, this to be more flexible. So the resolution itself, I don't have a lot of feelings towards. Sure, let's make it more flexible. It's really about the, the nuts and bolts of their rationale down towards the bottom. So you can see those bullets. Um, I said it made sense to me. Yeah, at first glance, I liked it. Yeah, I liked it too. 
So I guess my question is, should we try to amend the resolution to include some of those bullets and the specific things? Because those are the items that the, the districts that have implemented this PTEC program have identified as needs. And so, like I said, the resolution itself I see is fairly anemic. And so trying to actually codify the recommendations into the resolution itself seem to make sense to me. But would that be um, boxing in anything where keeping it kind of open? I, I don't know. I'm just saying like, is that why it's like that? It, it might be. I, I just think that there's, I, maybe it's more of a wordsmithing piece and that may be something sure. of just like how to keep maybe an innovation word or something in there so that that could result in not boxing us into only those things. Sure. Sorry, I'm trying to make notes since so I have something to reference back to based off of our discussion when I get there. Mr. Salt, one thing that caught my eye in there was the expansion of the work based learning. And I just I, I think that's really important. I think that's an area that our state can improve on and in our local area as well, just in the El Paso County Pikes Peak region, especially as we have more high tech industries moving in. I think if we have more flexibility and resources to support work based learning that that would help. Thank you, Ms. Allen. I have a question. Is this just for PTEC? Because we don't currently have PTEC here. We don't or have this far. This is specifically for PTEC. That's what I thought. And so this isn't a program that we have, but we're it, supporting it further. We're supporting this for other districts. And if there's ways that they found to make this more flexible and work better yeah. for them and their students, yeah. I'm willing to support that effort. That's why I was trying to say to keep it open in the yeah. language. Yeah. Because then it could, could be for other things us. for what we would need. All right, resolution 15, CASB supports legislative direction to seek a federal waiver that allows for a more meaningful alternative measure to the CMAS science exam and show proficiency in science as required by ESSA. My concern is that we are left without a science um, assessment in the interim because like this and the next resolution, I don't agree with getting rid of any core curriculum, core subject assessments. Yeah, it was, I was going to say, my, my concern with this was what's the rationale for trying to get a waiver out of some of the core subjects? But it looks like they're looking for an alternative. I think they still want to assess science. Yeah, I didn't see this as getting away from assessing science. Yeah, they just Correct. want to look at something this, different this, the for the CMAS new generation is, science standards. It, it's been flawed and uh, certainly broken up because of the pandemic, so maybe there's a better answer. That's how I read that. So as long as that's the intent, I'm, I was I was OK with that. And sure. we would still test on it during that process. That's, they that's what I don't want to lose. They wouldn't as an just assessment. take something away and without and my, the alternative. The way I'm reading it. But, so. Yeah, my, my answer was seems reasonable. And then I said, Dr. Field, what say you? So you already answered. Yeah. Um, anything we can waiver out from the federal government is probably a good thing, in my humble opinion. So I'm assuming we're going to take the same philosophy with the social studies assessment as well. They're effectively identical resolutions, one's for science, one for social studies. You know, well, social studies, um, and again, I'll defer to Dr. Field, but um, that isn't even applied at all schools. It's applied at select rotating schools. So in terms it's of- It's gone too. Yeah, in terms of longitudinal data, anything else, um, you might get achievement for that little block at that point in time, but you had no longitudinal data. so to see if it's efficacious education in our schools, it wasn't a great measurement. So. You know, my, I, I kind of tend to agree with you. I've, I struggle with this one because good people on both sides disagree, but, but yeah, especially the fact that you can't look at it longitudinally because it's not given every year. Um, <clears throat> I, I tend to, I tend to agree as much as I'm a numbers guy. I, I, I think I lean towards getting rid of the so, social studies testing. I'd like to hear Dr. Field what you guys, your all thoughts are on that. On social studies testing? Yeah. Well. Do we get good information, good valuable data? We haven't tested on social studies. 
social studies, we haven't tested in the last couple of years on social studies. But we will, right? And then we won't, and then we won't. And then when we, we were testing on social studies, schools would go every three years. Right, and I think that's still the case, right? The specific grades, oh, I'd have to ask Joe Lynn if it's coming back. So again, yeah, it's just almost like a, it, Dr. Heber, what are your thoughts? I, I keep going to Dr. Field. You know a little bit about this too. Do you have an opinion about that? Because that's the way they do social studies here. It's just every once in a while they, they test it. Well, what I'm hearing from uh, Dr. Fields is that, you know, if, if we're testing students, we need to be able to use the data. So if we only test them every three years, is that really um, something that is usable and uh, by our teachers, by our system to see where we're at? Um, if we in fact want to assess social studies, it doesn't sound like it's been that effective in informing our district or our achievement. Maybe that's something that we need to look at and potentially, you know, there's something in the future that we could propose, but I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure we want to continue to support a testing system that doesn't seem to be uh, giving us any kind of benefit for our system. So I'm hearing we're good. Putting the resolution for supporting the resolution to ask the legislature to get a waiver. All right. I don't like that rationale statement, but we can we can move on. So yeah, I'm, I'm with oh, yeah, you. Yeah, the rationale statement. Yeah. Well, we're looking. But I still agree with the resolutions. Overall. Yeah. Yes. All right. Seventeen uh, new teacher mentoring. So this one. Um, is effectively a, a can grant that would come out. Yearly funding would be calculated by the last three years average of the district's hiring licensed staff and be adjusted yearly. This is another one where uh, they don't talk about where the money is coming from. And so I, I have a hard time supporting these resolutions when we're like, give us more money, but just give us more money. I don't care where you get it from, just print more. Um, and then send it our way. So that was that was my hesitation here, not because I don't think we need to have mentoring programs in place. I think that's in incredibly impactful, but having something without a pot of money, uh, some dedicated funding source, just gives me the the willies a little I bit. I agree. In yeah. my opinion, it is a reason why we need an MLL. But these are state dollars that are coming in. I understand that, but I'm saying that's how we, as a district, will find that money. It just seems like a blank check. So, so no on the resolution. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Next, and I prepped Ms. Kuzer for this one. Uh, Casby resolution on HB 211 um, Do you want to give us the 30 second overview of what 1110 is, what it's requesting, and then we can talk about the resolution briefly? Certainly. So, um, the House Bill 21, which is ironic because if you look at 21, um, that's when it was rolled out, and it really talks about web accessibility for all content, um, which is not just necessarily external, which was dealt with you know, a few years ago when we did the Outward Facing website, but it's all internal content, including what teachers publish, what schools publish, and so we're talking a lot of data. Um, the interesting part about this bill is that it was really not targeted to school districts. They mentioned it as special districts, and it wasn't until of recent that they said, oh, school districts fall under special districts. Well, we lost out on at least two years kind of to Pooter's um, you know, point. And so um, really and truly, I, I looked at the rationale, and I completely agree that it's going to do one of two things because there is monetary um, recourse if you are not in compliance by the OCR. Um, people can bring suit to the district. I think it's like $3,500 per incident. And um, so this adds to, you know, a lot of the legal work that Tanya would have to be doing as well. But I think more importantly, it's going to cause people to pull content down, which was one thing that Pooter had brought up as well. So it's not going to make it more accessible. It's going to make it less accessible because it's not going to be there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I was going to support this because actually Ms. Kuzner and I talked a little bit about this uh, when we we're doing our second day tours. Um, when you get the weird people together, we talk about weird things. So uh, <laughs> it's all the. It's all, 
Yeah. It's all the tech oh, stuff, man. Happy. Speak for yourself. Yeah. yeah. It's all the tech stuff. Uh, so that's what I was supportive of this, trying to, to kick that, give districts more time to, to implement this. Mr. Salt, if I can just give some context. Absolutely. So we um, worked with OCR. It took us four years to get the website to full web accessibility standards. So, and that was four years of weekly meetings with OCR. This is not, I mean, we need time. This is going to take some serious time because it's not just fixing documents. It's retraining 3,000 employees about how they create documents. It is a lot of work. It frankly stresses me out. <laughs> Aaron, do you think there'd be any appetite to move this date even further along? So I think the way they have it written in here where we get two years after the OIT final rules are set is sort of whenever those rules get finalized, we get an additional two years. And so I think that's probably a good enough window. Okay. Personally, I'll defer, but I think I thought that was, it buys us time in at least two years, probably a little bit more. It's better than one year. I mean, really, it, it kind of ties it down to it would be two years. And if it's not set now, it probably won't be set until next year. So you're still talking, you know, the two years. It means that we can still start to prep. Other school districts, I mean, we meet on a monthly basis. Aurora is kind of leading the charge to determine and work with the Attorney General's office on what this really means for the districts. So we're meeting and there's very little clarity around what this really means. It's like, we'll go train people. Well, make your documents accessible. Well, there's more to it than that. And that's what school districts are really kind of looking for guidance. Do I hear three years past OIT? It came out in 21. It's implementing in 24. Um, so really, if you're looking at apples to apples, that really would align with what other state government agencies were given. Thank you. All right, resolution number 19, funding early childhood classroom construction. This was a modification to the best grant to include the early childhood. I didn't have any real issues with that. No, as a matter of fact, when we're in Canyon City, they used, uh, they're using best funds for some other capital uh, work down there and it's material to them. Um, so uh, certainly support the program and this looks more like a statement than anything else, right? I, I I like best a lot. I oppose this. I, I don't, this is for, of course, my bias was I would, I oppose universal preschool anyways. So this, this is more, this is now taking best money that would go to put a roof on a high school and now it's going to go to daycare and I oppose that. That's just me. My rationale behind this was many districts were put into a place where they had to modify things and there was no additional dollars to come in. And so this is helping because of the law that came in. And so we had the unfunded mandate. This just allows, and now this is the way I'm reading it. Maybe this isn't right. I don't see it as being, uh, this is flexibility in how those best dollars are used, not subscribing a portion of those best dollars to have to go to pre-K. And so districts who incurred those expenses or need to in the future to help expand their their pre-K areas, this would allow them the flexibility to do so. If they don't need a new roof on a high school, I don't want to restrict them to having to put a new roof on a high school when they need to build pre-K rooms. That was why kind of my rationale here. Uh, resolution 20, full and sustainable funding for BEST, full and adequate funding for the BEST program. Um, I didn't have a lot of notes on this one. 
Yeah. So I, I had a big question mark on this one. I didn't really feel one way or the other. I didn't realize, I mean, I like sustainable funding, something that our state legislature doesn't do a whole lot of, so I wasn't really sure how urging them to do that's going to play out. Mr. Salt, I kind of looked at this one uh, almost like the one at the beginning, just about fully funding the School Finance Act. I just didn't see a how when I read this. So I'm in the same boat as you were. Yeah, and that's part of why I mean, my note here is a question mark, because um, <laughs> I really wasn't sure what to do with it. So I guess I'll keep it as a question mark and then someone can provide really good rationale for supporting it while we're there during the debate. You know, maybe Telluride has some really convincing stuff behind it and they have a way to, you know, plan for it and we can support it. Otherwise, it probably won't. And I yeah. struggle a little bit if I don't know where the how, because I would like to see the School Finance Act fully funded with no budget stabilization factor before we start pulling any money out of K-12. That's typically the stance that I take is until you can give us all the funding that we need, I really don't want special projects. And, and since there's going to be three or four more of these about BEST, just for the audience, BEST stands for Building Excellent Schools Today. And, and a lot of the marijuana tax money goes into BEST, um, and I don't know how much, but it it is designed for safety, security, uh, building upkeep primarily, and it's and it's a you put in it, it varies. I don't know the formula, but but you put in 40 percent, and the and the state puts in 60 percent, or vice versa, and all these different schools apply, and then they have a competition. So that's what BEST is, and and I will say. About 10 years ago, TCA got some best money and it helped them, I think, to redo one of their elementaries or something. But it, it, in, in, in Colorado Springs, uh, we never get it, District 20, but other, you know, smaller rural districts uh, will get it. At Title I schools, yeah, that's what best is in case y'all are wondering. All right, Resolution 21, CASB supports making educational professionals preschool in K-12. A priority in any and all state housing programs. Any thoughts on this one? I didn't like the preschool part. I don't think we should be. I know I'm, I'm a broken record. I don't think the state should be providing housing for for daycare. But I, I'm, maybe I'm a minority. That's me. This for me was more of a. This is additional state restriction on housing plans and housing markets, and now this goes to to political, I, <laughs> a little bit on on your philosophy, right? On whether or not the government needs to put more regulations in. So I'm a less regulation person, and so I was oppose that just from the regulation sense. And like Miss Allen said, is is school funding fully funded? No. Then then where is this going to come from? You know, I, I wish we just get all the money and then let. You know, block grant it to us and then let us decide what to do with it. Yeah, I agree. And I think there's a duality to tell you right, bring this up because they are a ski resort and I used to be a vice president for Steamboat. And we didn't expect the state to subsidize low income housing for our people. We did it ourselves. We figured it out. And so taking money out of K through 12 to funnel it this way just is just moving ships around. 22 minimum wage this one would support uh, minimum wage for every teacher in Colorado going up to $45,000 this was another one where as much as I like the idea here this would put a huge burden on a lot of our small and rural districts to to do that um, some of them can support it some of them can't and so having this requirement put on them um, across the state would be really restrictive to some of the other districts. So I was going to sit for that. Any other thoughts? Again, they mention a subsidy in here and I get worried. Where is that coming from? Yep. I said oppose, just give them more PPR. Like the sound said. All right, uh, resolution 23. This is actually one that we saw last year as well. We amended it last year, and so I have effectively the same amendment this year that we proposed last year. Uh, the amendment that I proposed last year was accepted by the body, 
um, and that was effectively to chain uh, strike the end of uh, this first bullet or the middle part. So providing additional revenues for funding such as increasing the MLO cap for the small rural districts to 35 percent, but leaving the the cap where it is for the rest of the districts and really just provide that flexibility for those rural districts to, to pass the MLO. So like I said, that seemed to, to appease the body last year. Um, so I was going to propose the same amendment this year if you guys are good with that. I mean, reading this right, this simply provides more freedom for individual districts. Right. So it allows them to to increase their mill levy higher. Correct. They so desire. And if because people currently vote. we have it's I think 25 percent for all districts and 30 percent for the rural districts. And so Summit, I believe, is at their cap. And so they're why they're presenting this is they want to go for additional MLO dollars. But because they're at 25 percent, they they've reached their cap and they can't ask for more money. I see this again with the smaller districts. I mean, 30. that's why we have a different between your rural districts and your regular districts already. So if we're going to allow flexibility, I really think that needs to go to those rural districts and not just allow every district in here to, to add cap. Although my answer would be, why not? If, if their voters want to want to give them the school more money, more power to them is, is kind of my thought. And you know, well, then why don't we just eliminate the cap altogether and you can ask for unlimited MLO dollars? You know what? Don't don't tempt me. <laughs> Maybe next year. Well, I, I don't know. I Again, it's just a state impinging on what school districts want to do. If I, I, That's my thought. If a school district wants to vote in a higher mill levy, then let them if, if the people vote for it. But I don't know that that's just I, I can. I'm just one of five. Any, any other thoughts? I, my only thought is, I mean, when you start getting into that, that's, um, I mean, you're really looking at the rural district piece of that, right? There's not an effect on us as far as our district. Correct. So it's hard for me to even have an opinion about it because it feels like, you know, no skin off. You know, it's not our sandbox, but I get it. So. I don't know. I, I defer to them. If you guys like it as is, we can keep it as is. That's like I said, we did push the amendment last year, and so that's why I wanted to raise that this year. Yep. Resolution number 24. <clears throat> Sustainability of the Colorado Intergenerational Public School Land Trust Fund. Did anyone have any thoughts on this? Do we want to get into all of the, the weeds hey, about it? This was hard to understand. It's a little dense. So HB 221146 um, effectively, I did a little bit of research on this, effectively created I might get this wrong. Um, it had a work group that went to look at the sustainability of the land trust. These are the recommendations. My understanding is that these are the recommendations from that workforce on how to make sure that that land trust um, persists. And if I recall, much of this land trust is the land trust funding is a lot of what drives the educational dollars in the state, I believe. That, that's the supplement outside of the tax dollars that are accrued. My comment was even more along Mr. Temby's lines. I wrote, I have no clue. I, I don't understand this. I, I don't. So I, I will completely defer to you. If, if Summit County can give you a cogent explanation and you think it's a good idea, then go forth. Sounds good. Number 25, sustainability of the best grant program. Um, let me read. I just wrote this would not help D21 bit. 
There's unless they understand a resolution, I can't support it. That's what I wrote. Now, I like the idea of sustainability from a funding perspective, but that was all that I had. So I didn't really have this one got to be a little dense that they, they had at least they had pictures and colors. <laughs> Yeah, this was for those of you following along at home. There's about seven pages of rationale behind it, um, which didn't make the resolution any clearer than it already was. So I'll just take that one and see if they have any clarity there. Uh, and then we'll, the nice thing is they'll have two minutes to to explain this there, so they'll have to get to the salient points pretty quick. Um, all right, resolution 26. This is protecting local control of uh, PPR from state initiative grants. Uh, I think District 38 puts this one forward every year where it's basically a protection on having that PPR and local control of where that goes. So it's really about free source of the funding instead of being earmarked. So yeah, I'm supportive. Likewise, uh, resolution 27 <clears throat> again is one that District 38 puts up pretty much every year where they just oppose legislation that usurps local control of instruction. Um, which is given to us by the Colorado Constitution, so supportive of that. 28, support for school district construction impact fees. Um, I've spoken, I know uh, John Graham with District 49 has been an outspoken advocate of this, where when there is land developed, they start doing the construction, they are, are impact fees that go to fire and to these others. We get land allotments, but we don't get all of the additional fees that go along to help build the school on the land. And so this resolution is urging our General Assembly to allow us to be included in collecting those fees from developers so that when we get the land, we can also have some funding to do something with it, which makes sense to me. Mr. Saul, I agree. Just as you said, we get two choices when a new development starts. We either get land dedication or we can request fees in lieu of land. Mm -hmm. And when we take the land, that's it. We're responsible for all of the costs to build, including the infrastructure sharing. And so if we could impose uh, impact fees, it would be helpful. Okay. Right. Thank you. All right, resolution 29, increase the best program's capacity to fund new school projects. Again, this doesn't really impact us a lot, so. I have a question. Yes, sir. For instance, this one says forwarded with a favorable recommendation. I, I think what you said was the subcommittee, if they were unanimous, they get that? No, no so if it's unanimous, it goes on the consent. If it is a majority vote of the committee, it gets passed forward with the, the little red. So red means the majority of the okay of the legislative committee um, agreed that this was a good resolution. So we can treat this one like the other ones if we want to, where it's uh, doesn't not really in our wheelhouse. Number thirty, yes. Yeah, number 30, no cell phone use in school zones. So this would be asking because there's very, uh, there's only the one, they talk about this in here, there's only one state statute that addresses school zone vehicle use. Um, and so this would increase, we want to have that increase to include no cell phone usage and that being a, you know, a violation. I think that's incredibly important uh, as cell phone usage becomes more prominent. Number 31, uh, we had this one last year, capture traffic violators with cameras on school bus uh, stop arms. This is a District 49 thing. Summit County has joined them in this now. Uh, we, per The way that the resolutions were at last year felt that we would then be required to have the cameras and sort of be policing agents by turning that footage in on violations. Um, so we proposed an amendment that would clarify the language that this was optional and just be in something that school districts could do. Um, the one here also lets it be kind of stated that this is a, an optional thing, so I don't have any issues with that because it's not worded as a mandate. So. <clears throat> Number 32, updates to 
Cora. Um, so, Ms. Thompson, I'm going to ask you if you have any thoughts on this, but it, just to hit the bullet points here, uh, this would increase the uh, reasonable amount of time to seven working days for regular requests, 14 days for your longer requests, increase fees that we could charge for um, legal fees and other fees incurred, uh, prioritize requests made to media outlets and legitimate media outlets on here, um, and then ensure PII are appropriately protected. So this felt fine to me, but I wanted to get sort of a legal perspective on this. I agree with your assessment this far, Mr. Salt. Yeah, I think the extended time would be helpful. Um, increasing the amount that we can charge would be helpful, although in this last session they reduced the amount we can actually charge. So, um, and then prior, prioritizing media outlet requests, we already do that anyhow, so that would not be problematic. And then ensuring that communication is does not include PII, we're already doing that as well. If I can add to Tanya's, I am in 100% full support of this. For instance, we got four core requests on September 17th. So when we have to do those in three days, it, it takes over everything you do. Like we literally have to stop everything and do Cora's and it has become, we're averaging, you know, you see we average about five a week um, on a good week. And so this would be tremendously helpful. Is there any opposition to this? I am fine with extending the time. I didn't like the idea of prioritizing requests made by media outlets, but if we're already doing that, oh well, and, and the increasing fees, my, my my fear, I just, I can imagine, you know, people just pricing people out, you know, they want to get something and now they want to, you know, the, I don't think we would do this, but I can see other entities charging, you know, thousands of dollars for information, effectively gutting Cora. So that was my concern. So it's mixed bag in my view. The problem that I've seen is that the fees that we're allowed to charge don't actually currently cover staff time and so every request costs us money and it's more money with the larger requests it's a it's a exponential problem almost yeah i could be convinced so i think if we put a limit on, i mean we don't want it open-ended of you can charge whatever you want but i think having a higher limit would help a lot of districts with the number of requests they have and the very least being net neutral in cost and not costing the money and if i can just remind you mr lavalle the first hour is free anyhow so they get an hour of our time absolutely at no cost to begin with it used to be that we could charge um the actual expense of the person who did the retrieval their time and now it's capped at roughly 33 dollars and so um that's where we're at right now I was a little hung up on the prioritizing the media outlets and the reason why not because I don't think that's important but we have three days to respond and so it's like they're kind of getting it pretty quick anyway and some requests are easier than others I know um, some requests are very simple they're existing documents and you can forward those on and so there's a little bit of a prioritization I think that goes on anyways I don't know if you would agree with that Ms. Cortez I, I agree so I think leaving that to the districts to to prioritize how they want, it's probably already happening. So to call it out in here, yeah. it just felt unnecessary for me. So it wasn't a a problem with it. It just felt like I think we're already doing this. And so I don't know that we really need to list that in here as something to do. Well, I understand the pragmatism because you're trying mm -hmm. to run the balance of good relations mm -hmm. with the media. So expediency That's it. Um, equates probably to the to some media outlets is transparency. And I can, so, yeah. oh, I didn't mean to interrupt, I'm sorry. No, that's really what I had to say. It's 100% accurate. And the other thing I can tell you, um, we do not do this, but there are other organizations who will use the three days plus the seven days extension as a way to try to not be in the story. So we know that that's happening. So I see, I understand why they put that in there. My thought is nothing prevents them from doing that now. And so the other arm side of this is, if this says prioritize requests, this isn't a, 
you may prioritize requests. This is a you shall prioritize requests that come from the media. And so then we are deprioritizing legitimate taxpayers and other stakeholders in, that are invested in this district in lieu of media. That gives me a little pause. But like I said, as of now, there's nothing that prevents districts from prioritizing the media to make sure that their side of the story is represented. And so if there was anything, I would meant to strike that bullet. Update to state hiring laws. Support strengthening state law to the maximum amount possible to prohibit or make it more difficult for those convicted of offenses against children from being employed in positions in school districts where there will be working directly with pre-K through 12th grade students. Mr. Smart, do you have any issues with uh, this resolution? No. Is that a yes or no? Thank you. you. You didn't support the uh, state. Oh, yeah. No, I thought you said you were not supportive. And so I was like, uh, I think we want to restrict that. Uh, number 34, support for economic freedom and impartial classrooms. Uh, this is a resolution put forth by District 11, uh, kind of contracting the CEA's resolution uh, where they specifically stated that they believe capitalism exploits children and to push for a well, more of a Marxist ideology. Any thoughts on this? Yeah, in talking to Matt Cook, I know that they were going to be having conversations with CEA about the wisdom of that. I'm not sure anything formal in terms of an action from their board would be forthcoming. It was just a, we don't agree with that. So I'm not sure if it needs to go any further. I think CEA has been chastised uh, in the same manner that NSPA was once chastised for some poor judgment. I agree with that. I would say there was a very different tack taking with the NSBA. There was immediate action that the entire organization was aware of. Nothing public has happened with the CEA. I know that's a little bit different of an organization. Um, yes, and so I, I think the chastising of the organizations backlash from members was probably, in my opinion, the extent of the similarities here um, because one was, you know, resolution passed by the organization itself. The other was an individual who worked with the organization who was terminated, apologies, etc. And so the way the NSBA handled that I thought was fine. And actually we supported a couple amendments last year or a couple of resolutions last year around um, the NSBA and supporting that because of the actions that they took in the wake of that misstep. Um, again, CEA has not had any sort of a public face countering this, and so I'm still supportive of this. Anybody else? I'm not supportive of us having our own resolution to this effect. I think we can express our displeasure, but you know, you know you're not going to get um, in the case of NSBA any rogue action. You're not going to get some sort of leadership change or something at CEA as a result of this resolution. That's all. I, I just think I it's support. an apple and a pomegranate. So I support moving ahead with it because it just it, it makes a takes a stance. On I do. Gasby, how Gasby <coughs> feels about public education. So do I. I I, I support this. Okay, that moves forward.
35 guardrails for artificial intelligence use in education environments. Uh, this is really around making sure that there are some restriction regulations in place around student privacy data. So without reading all of the rationale um, here, that was the. It seems like a good thing to me. Anything that we can. AI is such a. Such a large thing. And once that data is there, it's there. And I I don't think students have good long term understanding of implications. And so ways that we can put some restrictions around it to help protect that student data, I think would be wise. Any other thoughts? OK, 36. <laughs> CASB supports creating safer learning environments through the development of a transparent, fair, and data-driven student risk assessment tool. I thought this was really broad and a little vague. Um, we have risk assessment tools that we utilize currently, so I don't know what the purpose of having this done at the state level would be. My big concern with this one was, quote, safely and more quickly returning students to the classroom who have been suspended or expelled due to making threats of physical harm to others. I don't want the state telling us how long we can keep kids out. We know and and I, I really oppose this one. I, I did not like this one. Yeah, I was thinking I was, lo no. local rule as this. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say, I think that we do a really good job here with our risk assessment tools that we have, and I don't see a need for it. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Uh, 37, CASB supports creating alternative pathways for experienced teachers to receive licensure in SPED and early childhood. Uh, I know the state legislature actually had so, some of the reciprocation laws that they, uh, I forget how many, is like 25 states or so that they, they added. And so my thought with this was we should support it, but we should broaden it even more and not limit it just to the SPED and early childhood space, but really work towards opening of that licensure, opening up um, reciprocation across the the country. Were my thoughts. And you, so you were reading my notes. I said support, make it easier for all teachers. I agree, special ed and early childhood, that's great. But how about all teachers uh, or you know alternative pathways? I. I I, I had um, breakfast with the new TCA president a couple days ago. He wanted to meet, and, and he told me that there is a physician that I think was up at the academy, and he's now teaching anatomy at TCA. And and basically, he said he would never go get his licensure. He's he's a physician, but he wants to teach. And that's I mean that's an example to me. I go, my goodness, you know. So, anyways, I I, I support this, but I think it'd be nice to add. So I'll probably have an amendment that tries to to spec that out. Can I just mention one thing? Absolutely. The, the other component of this, which is critical, is for teachers that already have a license that then want to get a special education teacher's license. Right now, you have to go back and go through a program, and it's kind of cost prohibitive for a lot of folks, so they choose not to do that. This would give a pathway where they could take the praxis and then do induction within their own district, um, and be able, so they'd be able to earn a three-year license and then do induction within their own district um, programs and then be able to uh, secure their their clear license, if you if you call it that. So that that's a critical component that is really needed at this time. And so that's why I would support this. Thank you, Cameron. That's great insight. And those are all the resolutions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Salt. Best of luck there. Uh, th I think it's in Grand Junction. No. It's in Glenwood. Same thing. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. So That's on that note, uh, just so everyone's aware, I will be remote for that meeting because I'll be driving up there that night. So I'll be You'll be remote for our board meeting. For our board meeting, traveling up there because it starts very early the next morning. And so we have a hotel that night. Okay. Uh, thank you. 2023 Casby Region 6 meeting debrief. Uh, I had to work. I could not attend this. So... Uh, Mr. Temby, you have the floor. Um, actually, I wanted to hear um, Superintendent Haber's uh, impressions because it was a first uh, meeting as superintendent. Um, again, I think the from a holistic standpoint, the benefit of 
uh, the continuing education about things going on, a legislative briefing, uh, but most importantly, uh, getting uh, to meet other peers around the state, uh, visit a school district and look at their best practices and Canyon City's certainly doing some good things there. Uh, totally different school district in terms of enrollment and resources, but uh, they are cracking the code on some things. Um, so I get a lot out of those meetings, so, you know, either directly or indirectly. So, but I did want to defer to Superintendent Haber for her impressions. I would agree with you, and I know it was really helpful to talk to the superintendent of Cheyenne Mountain as well as um, Canyon City. And one of the things that uh, Canyon City had just put in place was a portrait of a graduate. So I had a chance to talk to him a little bit more about. Uh, they had a really nice graphic, I thought, and just kind of what their journey is, and then being able to talk to some of the other school board members too, and just kind of find out about what some of their challenges were. And, um, certainly, Nicole and I had a great ride down and back, which really was nice to be able to spend that time together too. But the meetings were awesome. <laughs> yeah. Anything else on that? Yes, Ms. Conjure. Um, the one thing that we do is we move that around and it goes to our whole region. And so being that it was in Canyon City, it was a smaller group than we usually see. So um, it's been a minute since we've had it up here. I would love to see that um, come up this way because I think we'd have a better um, attendance. But I also recognize that it's important for the more rural areas to you know, show off their buildings and, and they had, like you said, some really great programs in place. So um, I really liked that. It wasn't the last one at D49? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then Pueblo before that. So Try. I'm saying like, let's right. come up the road. Yeah, sure. Okay. Thank you, Mr. I Tembe. Just, I, yes, Mr. LaValle, thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, Ms. Connors, forgive I'm me. Sorry. Forgive me. It's oh. getting late. I'm just being <laughs> sassy. No, I just wanted to say it was, um, yeah, it's fun with the interaction with everybody. And of course, just to see their school and their pride in it. It was because we get such extensive legislative updates here from Ms. Thompson and her team. Um, it wasn't very valuable to me to be there because that was a lot of the meeting. Um, last year we did some more table small group brainstorming and work and I wish we had done that. That was my exact um, feedback to them that night was that to collaborate that way but I think it was just because of the numbers because we were almost double if not triple the year before. So I think it just depends where it is. Very good. Heather, do you know how they pick where it is? Do I want to pick? No, do you know how they pick? Oh, I'm like, I, I can, can figure it out. Can I, is it something people reach out to them and say, hey, we want to host it? Do you, do you guys want yeah, to I'm host sure. it? I'm we should sure. do that. Yeah, I think we should do it. In, in, do it like at the village or something. No, or up in the DCC anatomy lab, that oh, yeah. table. Yeah, although that's that's the northern end of the district, but yeah. I'm just saying that's yeah. the southern end of that. That's true. That's okay, true. I can reach out to Casby and ask about that if you guys want. Okay. Thank you. That, that's a great idea. Yeah. Okay. Um, Ms. Cortez, how many people have we signed up? Do we have signed up to speak during public comment section one? This, there we go. This evening, <laughs> section one, we have one individual signed up. The board welcomes the comments of our community members. Speakers must sign up prior to 1 p.m. via an online form, and they must limit their remarks to two minutes or less. In deference to ASD 20 students, students will be allowed to speak during first during the first public comment section. Following any students, speakers who wish to comment on an agenda item will be called in order of their sign up. We also ask speakers to address the board and not others in the room. All speakers will be notified of the remaining time via the mounted monitors behind the dais. When the time has ended, the microphone will turn off. Supplemental written materials can be given to the security guards and they will be delivered to the board secretary. Profanity or any disrespectful behavior, behavior will not be tolerated. We greatly value all comments from the public. However, the board will not respond this evening. Our first speaker is Catherine Chukas.
Hi, I'm Catherine Chukas. I'm an Air Academy parent. I didn't think I would be here tonight, beat, but um, uh, luckily some traffic stuff worked out for me and some volleyball games ended earlier. It's really hard when you've got kids in two different fall sports. It's uh, really challenging. So um, I uh, wanted a West Side Animal update, update would probably be about a lot of bucks. There's a lot of young males running around the West Side right now. Um, watch out for them. Those are the ones which are really challenging for our kids when the sun isn't up to walk by. And we do have a lot of kids in our neighborhood walking at least a half a mile to the Air Academy bus. Again, Air Academy is a, is a place where people take buses to get there. And we've got a lot of people walking at least three quarters of a mile in the dark and there's bucks around. Um, my topic though was about your CASB resolutions. Um, I did listen to everything as I was in the car driving up here. Resolution 19. I'm very disappointed in only men speaking about uh, preschool. I'm also very disappointed that Mr. Lavalley seems to put forward a point of view that early, um, early childhood education is not education. If you think about the preschool sites on the Northwest side and our three elementary school sites, do you know how many spots are available for neighborhood families? Eight, eight in total for the three and four year olds, eight in total because there's only one classroom for those three in those three elementary schools that is set up as a preschool site. So when I hear about best funds, helping out uh, rural areas, lower income areas, thinking about actually redoing classrooms for early education, which really matters, you should take a look at the Heckman sites. James Heckman was a, uh, somebody I studied a lot in my graduate economics education. You should look at the Michigan studies about early childhood education and what it means for adulthood. And you should think about supporting this as a leader, as, as a district leader amongst all 178 districts. There's a lot of things we can do because we've got a lot of money. There's not a lot of things other districts can do. I have another point about resolution. Your time's up, sorry, thanks. Okay, so this, I believe is the second time in two consecutive board meetings, there are no action items. So we will go right into a public comment section two. Ms. Cortez, how many people do we have signed up to speak during public comment section two? We have one individual signed up for this section. And that first individual and only individual is Aaron Stevens. All right. I am questioning why we have a board member sitting on a public school board who is opposed to public school funding and voted no to put a mill levy override on the ballot. The proposed MLO, the first of its kind in 15 years, will help to pay our teachers a more competitive salary with surrounding districts and may even make it almost affordable to actually reside here. It will help us to retain as well as attract new staff to our district. The teachers are supportive of this measure, even the ones living in D20, who stand to have a nominal tax increase themselves. But that's not the only thing that MLO seeks to do. It will help us keep our schools more safe by making sure that every school has the security it needs. It will help to make sure that some of our older buildings have enough funding to do things like asbestos abatement. It will give money to the charter schools since they provide instruction to about 16% of our students. And it will ensure that money used to rebuild Air Academy and Douglas Valley doesn't mean that we can't do any other maintenance on our other aging schools. It seems disingenuous that you sit up there, Mr. Salt, to listening to the same presentations that we all do, yet you would vote against putting it on the ballot. The second concern that I want to address is Mr. Lavalley's unilateral, unilateral decision to forbid League of Women's Voters from moderating the already scheduled candidate forums. The League of Women's Voters is a nonpartisan organization that is comprised of Democrats, Republicans, and unaffiliated voters. They have impartiality, impartially moderated D20 forums in, your, in the past and are moderating for all nearby districts this year by essentially firing this well-respected organization due to your own personal ideologies and attempting to influence this election by restricting voter access to information, which is fundamental to the democratic process, you're taking away another information stream intended to educate voters. Learning about the Constitution goes hand in hand with voter education. To me, it appears that we have two current board members who are campaigning against what's in the best interest of the district. I feel like every single staff member, parent, and student, and voter in our district deserves an explanation. Just because you think something might be right for yourself does not mean that it's Sorry, your time's up. Debrief, Superintendent Haber, do you have any clarifications or next steps? Potentially next steps, just want to put this idea out. We uh, 
have coming up the idea of a fall student linkage. Right now we have it for October 19th. Uh, and I was just wondering if we aren't able to get a group of a larger group of students together for that, I'd like to offer uh, the possibility of having the linkage on the Student Advisory Council meeting that I already have scheduled uh, at November 1st at 9.45. So just something to consider. Uh, you can let me know. So that's a student advisory council. Yes, and okay. I have I have a good group there. The last time that they came together, and it's from every we have representatives from every school there already. And um, I mean, we can reach out, but since we already have a group that's committed, we just you know I just wondered if that we would want to use that student advisory group already as opposed to doing another, or we could try the 19th, and you know, depending on how many students were able to pull together, we could use that as an alternative. I just thought I'd put that out yeah. there. Board, any thoughts? Pro con? Pro or con? Have, no, it sounds great as an alternative. Have we already invited? It's just getting close, so that's my concern. Because I'm sure there's students at every school that want to participate in the linkage. Only if we offer them food. Yeah. That's right. Board, any other thoughts? As an alternative, yeah, I mean, it would be nice to have the myopia of that session, but if we have to co-mingle it, fine. Okay. Thank you, Superintendent Haber. I appreciate that. Anything else? Happy birthday to Allison Cortez on October 1st. She's, she's 29 years old. And Maureen Lang on October 3rd. So happy birthday to both of you. Uh, question five from the CASB self-assessment. Did the board focus on what is best for students and the district? I think so. I, I was really pleased, frankly, with spending all that time we did on academics uh, in the study session. I just thought it was really good to do. And, and for what it's worth, this was a long meeting. I think we all agree. And the public comments occurred at eight o'clock. So it's that, that's not that late. You know, we, this is kind of the first time we've really shifted. Um, uh, last time was with a really short meeting. So, was our business this evening focused on activities that promote and honor our mission statement, our belief statements, and our global end statement that reminds us that all students will have the knowledge, skills, and character necessary for a successful transition to the next level, and upon graduation will be fully prepared for success? We ended up with five people watching. This meeting is adjourned.